Good evening, y'all. Welcome back. It's another Sunday night here in stormy Chicago this week. It is absolutely gross outside. It has been raining all day. The thunder just started. Um, so if at any point tonight things suddenly freeze and I go away for the evening, um, I'm not too worried about the lightning because there's not a ton of it, um, but I can't control what the tree branches in my neighborhood do. So if, uh, if this gets cut short from storm, that's just what it is. <laughs> we'll just uh, we'll just roll with it, kind of like we do every Sunday night. Hey, Palmer, welcome back. Good to see you again at the end of another, just another week. You know, just another week. Hanging out, building things, trying to set too many things on fire, um, trying to inhale too many solder fumes, <laughs> making cookies. Just you know, all the usual stuff that one does week to week. Um, as always, we're gonna give our stragglers just a few extra minutes to join us before we dive in this evening. Um, we're going to kind of do a double topic this week. Not a double topic. We're going to do um, one topic, and then we're going to introduce next week's topic early. What a, what a concept. This week, we're going to talk about batteries, as he says as he looks to grab a battery that he'll be talking about for the whole rest of the night. We're going to talk about batteries this week. Um, we won't nearly cover everything there is to know about batteries, nor do I know everything there is to know about batteries. Um, but we're going to talk about battery power and working with Arduinos and batteries specifically. Um, and then at the end of the night tonight, I'm going to introduce um, the concept for the next week. So if you're watching this after the fact, you can jump ahead to a timestamp that I'll link in the description if I'm really fancy, he said, promising a thing that he's not sure he knows how to do. Um, but uh, we at the end of last week, we had a really great riff session about like ways that we could like talk more about coding in an interesting way that weren't what we tried to do in week six that was just kind of reading a pre-written program step by step, which was kind of dull. Um, so I've been thinking about how to make it more interesting and taking a lot of the feedback that we got last week um, to figure out how to do a, a more interesting version of it. And I, I think I've come up with a, a way to do it that I think will be fun that we can sort of all work on together. It's just a little teaser. And like I say, this is going to be the end of the night. You can ignore that sneaky piece. We're going to all essentially have the same basic circuit to work with. Um, and I've chosen it to have parts that really should be in everyone's starter kit or you'll have just lying around. And to that, we will add one more component of your choice. Um, a specific a sensor of some kind. It might just be a potentiometer, a light sensor, a fire sensor, vibration or motion. Um, and we'll use that to sort of build up um, a program piece by piece and that will let us introduce a bunch of programming concepts in one go without sort of getting too esoteric because I think part of the problem last time is we did that programming week in the same week that we talked about um, the 8x8 LED dot display and that was a lot to squeeze into a week and I think by the time we got to coding we were all just kind of just dead <laughs> a little bit. Um, and so I think, you know, spending a whole week just to talk about some common, we're spending next week talking about common programming patterns and we're gonna do it based on this circuit. So anyway, that's gonna be the second half of the night. Um, or the, the second third of the night? I don't know, we'll, we'll see. I'm sure we'll keep it to a tight 90 as always. So um, I'm sure we'll get to that at some point. Um, if I was really fancy and you're watching this after the fact, maybe there was like a tag that told you where to jump to and you can tell that I'm lying because there's no way tonight will be just 90 minutes because they never are, but we're gonna try. Um, where do we land on the lick the nine volt batteries argument, says Palmer? Um, not, not recommended as a, like a general health practice, but like what's really, what's the harm? Um, cause as we'll see later, nine volt batteries have low current capability, which makes them pretty safe to lick. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I don't know what y'all are drinking out there this week. This week I am drinking a charlatan APA from Maplewood Brewery here in Chicago, which is very tasty. Um, whatever, I'd love to hear what you're drinking as always, um, whether it's, uh, something boozy for the end of the week or the beginning of the week, what is a week anymore, or just hydrating, um, because hydration is important in these dry and parchable times. But with that, let's, uh, let's jump into it. Am I, uh, I rearranged everything. It's all, it's all cattywampus, but I think this will work. Um, batteries. Let's talk about batteries. Um, we're talking about specifically batteries through the lens of how do you use them with an Arduino, um, different types of battery, batteries, voltages, chemistries. We're going to talk about voltage regulators, which I realize we haven't actually talked about that. That's how you take one voltage and convert it to another in a regulated fashion. It's kind of a broad category of things, but we'll look at some sort of key examples. Um, and we'll look at voltage dividers, which is a structure that you can make with a couple of resistors to allow you to measure higher voltages than just five volts with your analog read function. Um, we had that, you know, back in week two, my God, so long ago, um, we, we, uh, 
looked at using the analog read function to measure analog voltages between zero and five volts. Um, here's a, now uh, for our battery situation, we might have a battery that runs at six volts or 10 volts or 14 volts. Um, I'm gonna show you a way you can measure that voltage as well and maybe take some action based on it. So let's dive right in. Um, what is a battery? A battery is, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> one or more electrochemical cells with width that's me, with with external connections for powering electrical devices. Um, so things that are not batteries include uh, like a solar cell, right? It needs to have um, an electrochemical cell. Somehow there's two or more chemicals reacting inside of a, usually a little box or maybe a big box um, to cause electrons to flow from one terminal of the box to the other and create a flow of electricity between them. Um, interesting side fact, um, the reason that they're called batteries is because some of the earliest developers um, noticed that when you were lining up a bunch of primitive batteries next to each other to create a higher voltage or a higher current capacity, it looked like a, a line of cannons all strung up next to each other. It looked like a battery of cannons. And so for a while, a battery had to be consisted of more than one of these individual cells. And eventually over time, it just became that a battery is one of these electrochemical things that produces charge on its own. Anyway, little tidbit, thought that was cool. Um, when you're thinking about batteries in your head, you can think about, you know, two typically metal plates, two electrodes or, or multiple electrodes, but two at least that stick out of the end with some kind of fluid typically in between them, but some kind of electrolyte that's mediating the flow of the chemical reaction between those two plates in such a way that the electrons that are sort of left over in that reaction are forced to flow external to the battery from one plate to the other, from the cathode to the anode. Um, I say often a liquid, it can be a liquid, it can be a, a gel, it can be a fluid that's absorbed by a, sort of a spongy material. There's lots of things that could be. Really, I, I'm not going to go super deep into the chemistry because, frankly, I'm not a chemist. But um, I, when we talk tonight about electrodes and electrolytes, I just want you to think, okay, the electrodes are the metal bits that are in the solution. The electrolyte is the solution that's mediating the chemical reaction between them. Because we're going to run into those terms a few times. That's all the chemistry, literally, we're going to have to know. just want you to know those terms. Cool. So let's dive in with the most uh, important parameters of the batteries that we are going to run across tonight. I know this looks like a lot. Um, and it is kind of a lot. Um, for our purposes, there's going to be a few parameters that are going to be sort of the most essential. But I, I want to like call these out because there are a lot of differences between battery types. Um, nominal voltage being one. Um, and we'll sort of like hit all these as we go through the battery types tonight, but just to like put them in one big list. How many volts does one of your batteries put out? So I'm going to use, we'll just get a little ahead of ourselves, but I'm going to use alkaline batteries, like our really common double A's, triple A's, nine volts, um, as they'll be the first thing we get to tonight. So a common double A battery is nominally 1.5 volts. Now, why do I say nominally? Well, as we'll see in a little bit, how much current you're trying to draw out of a battery can affect how much voltage it's putting out. Um, and as well as its lifetime. A 9 volt battery obviously is nominally 9 volts, although again that can sag based on current load. Um, capacity is another big parameter we care about for battery power. So capacity for batteries is typically measured in milliamp hours, um, and that's a really simple unit. It just measures how many milliamps of current um, can the battery put out for one hour, or I guess if you multiply the current you are pulling on the battery by the number of hours it could provide that current, you would get the capacity in milliamp hours. So um, a common AA battery, for example, has a capacity of about 2300 milliamp hours. So naively, we could say um, this could pull 2.3 amps for one hour or one amp for 2.3 hours. Now it turns out that both of those are a little bit beyond um, what a AA battery can actually provide. You can't actually pull a full amp out of one of these. And We'll look at that in just a sec. Um, but the product of the current and the time will always be, for some set of circumstances, around uh, that capacity, that 2300 milliamps figure. Uh, for, for this battery specifically, I'm actually going to get deeper into it in a second here. Um, but capacity is current times amount of time. Um, so uh, the more capacity you have, the longer you can run your Arduino, your cell phone, your whatever, uh, on that battery for, for a given object. Current capability, we kind of alluded to this a moment ago, how much current can you actually draw out of a given battery? Um, if we were to take, say, this AA battery and put a wire immediately across it, you know, as little resistance as we could, how much current would actually flow? I'm actually, I'm not sure if I know how much current would actually flow, but I have this device that will tell me. Um, let's find out. I'm gonna set this to my DC amps range, and we're gonna short this battery and see how much current will flow out of it. 
We'll find out together. <laughs> so I'm gonna take my ammeter probe here and set it to DC mode. I'm gonna set it in the correct polarity and we'll see how much current we get. Ooh, three amps and quickly falling, but I'm impressed. I didn't know you could pull that much current out of the, a AA battery even momentarily. Now we saw that current was sort of falling there and that's pretty typical. Um, a lot of batteries can provide a higher surge current, a higher momentary current um, than they can sort of in the long term. So if I had a device that I needed to have three amps available to it all the time, a single AA battery, even if a volt and a half was enough, might not be the right solution. Um, but that's, I'm impressed, that's pretty good. Let's actually, just as a point of clarification, let's do the same with this nine volt battery. We'll set it to DC amps mode again. We'll line that up and right polarity, plug that in, plug that in and we get, yeah, falling much more quickly. So we started about like two and a half amps, but really quickly falling. Nine volt batteries are not really known for their current capability, their ability to provide current. Um, they're meant for applications that um, have the, um, have a low current requirement in the long term. Um, you know, something like a smoke detector that's sipping, you know, a milliamp once a minute or microamps on average um, would be the kind of thing that you would use a, a nine volt battery for. So maximum current capability is one of the, the things we care about. Um, can you recharge it? Um, for alkaline batteries like double A's, the answer is no. Um, for uh, some of the batteries we'll look at later, like lithium ion batteries or lead acid batteries, sure you can. So I think to keep in mind, do you want to be able to recharge your battery? The self-discharge rate. So every battery will slowly over time um, discharge itself. Um, so if it starts at, you know, say has 2300 milliamp hours of capacity in your typical double A, um, say, uh, usually they're measured on a monthly scale. After a month, it may have discharged maybe 5% of its overall capacity. I think for a typical AA, it's actually somewhat lower than that, maybe one to 2%. Um, some of especially of the more esoteric battery types, like the, um, the various rechargeable batteries have very high self-discharge rates. So you really can't leave them just sitting around like you can a AA battery. Um, but uh, some, so, so a, thing, a thing to think about, if you're thinking about doing a battery powered application, let's say you were doing a trail cam um, that you wanted to leave in the woods with a motion sensor. Um, and uh, when it, you know, the motion sensor uses a very small amount of power. When it sees motion, it snaps a picture and then it shuts itself, puts itself back to sleep again in a very low power mode. And you might leave it there for a couple of years. Um, in that situation, you would want a battery with a very low self discharge rate, because even if your circuit isn't using a lot of power, you're wasting a lot of power just, um, just with the battery draining power out of itself, which is not particularly useful. Um, so that's self-discharge. Uh, internal resistance is sort of related to um, current capability. You can think of a battery as being like an ideal voltage source with a resistor placed in series with it. So we could think of this AA battery as being a one and a half volt source that has some resistor chunked on right at the end. Um, and for a variety of, you know, batteries, your internal resistance may be lower or higher. If your battery is meant to deliver a lot of current all at once, that internal resistance is going to be very low because it's going to want to um, spit out a lot of current, not have any, any resistance internal to it to get in the way. Um, but a battery like a 9 volt is, has a pretty high internal resistance because of its internal structure. Um, and that's would imply to us that this is a battery that's more suited for low current applications because we're going to always have to overcome the resistance internal to that battery, if that makes sense. Um, man, it's only half the list. Let's jam through the rest of these. Weight and density. How heavy is the darn thing? And how much capacity or power output does it have per that amount of weight. Um, we'll see later that some batteries are very light for how much power they hold, some are very heavy. If you're building a quadcopter or a model airplane, that might uh, be really important to you. If you're building a car where you're already working and you know, the weight is gonna be in the tons range, maybe the difference between a 10 pound battery and a 20 pound battery doesn't really make a difference to you. Um, disposal, lots of the materials and batteries and sort of goes to the next one too are toxic and you can't just throw them in the trash can. Um, does that make a difference to you? In your application, do you need something where you're gonna be cycling through disposable batteries really quickly or taking them to a, a place where it's not going to be easy to safely dispose of them? Do you need to worry about sort of the, the metals that are in your battery? What kind of connections does it have? Do you need something that has screw terminals or a really easy to attach plug? Their batteries, batteries and battery packs that come with each type. How expensive are they? I mean, goodness knows, double A's are really cheap. 
compared to you know how much power they can hold because they're everywhere um but they might not be right for you so are you willing to spend a little bit more to have a higher a higher quality or higher capability or a higher capacity battery and finally prevalence there are lots and lots of battery types out there um do you want to use a kind that's really special and they only make them for the space shuttle and there's only one in existence or do you want to use a more common type like a double a or an 18650 like we'll see later that are used everywhere and so if you break one you can get it again pretty easily so not the only parameters for sure um, but some things that we'll be like using to like pick apart what what kind of battery do you want to be using in your project um, I should say I would back over here um, I sort of alluded to this earlier voltage capacity and current coming out of a battery are all sort of interrelated the more current you pull out of a battery the more its voltage will tend to sag below that nominal voltage. So a double A, I said, is nominally, you know, one and a half volts. But if we put a high load on this, if we really dead short it, that voltage will tend to sag down a little bit to 1.4, 1.3, 1.2. Um, so you want to make sure that you're thinking about how, how low is my battery going to drift in use? Or am I really relying on it being, a, you know, a volt and a half in this case at all times? Or am I still okay if it sags some. The other thing is, as a battery is used, is depleted, depending on the type, its voltage may change as well. A really fresh AA battery will be 1.5, 1.6 volts. A really dead one might be as low as 1 volt, might 1.9 volts. Um, so if you're thinking about, you know, my end user is going to put this battery in their device, or I'm going to put this battery in this thing that I'm building, um, it's going to start at 1.5 volts. If, if I have, say, you know, a four AA battery pack, if all of them sag to 1.4 volts, that's almost half a volt I've lost from my circuit. Is that going to be okay? Or do I really need to sort of engineer to have more voltage headroom on my circuit there? Um, this is, uh, this graph is actually pulled from the data sheet of a, a, a AA battery, I think from Duracell that I pulled from DigiKey. Um, and you can sort of see, you know, we, that was the relationship between voltage and current. This sort of shows that the, the relationship between current and capacity. So we're showing you here is that if you take this AA battery and you pull about 25 milliamps out of it, which is um, just for point of reference, that's like about the maximum current we'd put through one of our little five millimeter LEDs. If you only pull 25 milli milliamps out of it continuously, you get something up here in like the 2800 milliamp hour range. So you'd run for well over 100 hours at 25 milliamps. And just so we we are clear their cutoff point to say, hey, this is a dead, dead battery. We're going to let this thing run continuously until that battery has dipped from full to 0.8 volts. <laughs> that's when like, that's, that's when we're done. If you pull just this little sip of current, you get 2,800 milliamp hours. If you pull a little bit more at 100 milliamps, you come down to maybe 2,500 milliamp hours. If you pull half an amp out of a AA battery, which as we just saw, you can do, um, you only get 1,500 milliamp hours. And presumably this would continue to go down and down and down. This is just sort of where the data sheet has sort of specified, implying that maybe you shouldn't be pulling more than half an amp out of one of these AA batteries sort of in a, in a general use case. Um, this is a, this characteristic of how the voltage and capacity and current are interrelated changes based on battery types. So here's a graph excuse me, um, for a lithium battery, a rechargeable lithium polymer battery. We'll, we'll talk about those later. Um, but what I want you to see is that um, they sort of graph this in a different way. Um, this solid line up here is them saying, hey, if you pull at one milliamp, you get this 3,500 milliamp hours of capacity here. If you pull at uh, 10 milliamps, you get the same. If you pull out 100 milliamps, you get the same capacity. Lithium batteries in particular are good about giving you their full capacity over a wide range of currents. But look what happens to the voltage here, right? If you're only sipping a milliamp out of it, this particular cell has a nominal voltage of, you know, about 1.7 volts. You know, once it's, once it's depleted some, it starts to dip to 1.6, maybe 1.5. And then right when it reaches the end of its capacity, it just nosedives. It's just done. Um, if you're running it, say, at 100 milliamps, you don't start at 1.7 volts. You start at maybe 1.5 volts, and you, you run at that rate pretty consistently until this thing dies. Um, so at the end of the day, you're getting less, pow uh, less power out of your battery, right? Your, your current is the same. Your, your current is, let's see, how do I say this? Your current is 
uh, higher, but your total voltage is lower. And since your capacity is the same, you're getting less total power out of your battery, right? We're running for, for less time at a higher current. Um, and your the higher current isn't making up for the decrease in time that you have. But at least your voltage is not really dropping off in that really, you know, in a really steep way like an alkaline battery would. Lithium batteries are really good about maintaining their voltage at a set level until they just tank at the end of things. But we'll get to lithiums in a little bit. I just wanted to throw out that like, we're gonna talk about battery capacities here a little bit. And you'll often see like, oh, this is a 3000 milliamp hour battery. This is a 2800 milliamp hour battery. That's under a particular set of circumstances, sort of a particular set of set te test conditions. Um, and if you are outside the range of those test conditions, you can't necessarily assume that that capacity or that voltage level holds. Does that sort of make sense? Let's check people are popping off here. What did I say? Less energy? Yes. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, sorry, Kenneth. I got, I got energy versus power, less total energy extracted from the battery um, over the, set, the course of time. Um, because power is energy over time. Thank you for that. Um, so let's, let's talk about battery types. Um, there are two different families of batteries that think, well, you can divide batteries up in a lot of different ways, um, but here's one way to think about them. Are they rechargeable? What did I say? Energy is power over time? Oh man, Kenneth, I'll get it right someday. Maybe when I take an engineering course. There's two different types of batteries. Um, one way to divide them is what we call primary cells and secondary cells. Um, and that essentially means a primary cell can be used once and then it's past its prime and it's done. And there's not an easy way to recharge it, or at least just applying an electrical voltage to the cell doesn't cause the chemical reactions to reverse and allow you to use those chemicals to generate that energy again. Um, the other type we'll get to in a little bit is called secondary cells, and those are kinds where you uh, allow a chemical reaction to happen to generate some electricity, and then you basically pump electricity into the battery to reverse the chemical reaction, or at least pretty well reverse it, to allow you to use that battery again. Um, so first, let's talk about primary cells. Um, the two major kinds you'd see in the world, and there's lots and lots of different kinds. I spent a lot of time this week on the types of batteries Wikipedia section. All kinds of weird types of batteries. We're kind of going to focus, since this is a practical thing that we do, we're going to talk about the, uh, the batteries that you're most likely to run into in the real world or maybe want to use. Um, of course, most common kind of primary cells are alkaline batteries that we've been sort of playing with already. Your common, your, your AA, your 9 volt, your AAA battery, your D cells, your C cells. Um, they're called alkaline batteries, by the way, because that electrolyte, that, that liquid or, or other substance that's in between the two metal ends of this, helping facilitate electron flow or, or um, ion flow, um, is alkaline, is a base, as opposed to many batteries where it is an acid. An alkaline battery has a base, uh, hence the name. Alkaline. Um, alkaline batteries, um, typically a single cell of an alkaline battery has a nominal voltage of about 1.5 volts. And that's true whether it's a AA, a AAA, a C cell, a D cell. Um, they have pretty decent capacity for their size and their weight, and especially for their price. Um, a AA, like we were looking at earlier, might have you know three amp hours of capacity at 50 milliamps. Um, and of course, as you pull more current out of it, your total capacity drops. Um, but you still can use them in some higher current situations. Um, they're cheap, of course, you can't recharge of. But in most places, or at least here in Chicago, I, I don't know if this is true um, anywhere else in the world, um, but you can just throw them in your trash can because they're sorted out uh, at the waste facility for you, which is kind of a neat feature. You can't do that with a lot of different batteries. Um, so one thing that sometimes gets people confused is, um, you know, I said a AA battery is one and a half volts nominal. A AAA battery is also one and a half volts nominal. A C cell and a D cell are also one and a half volts nominal. How can that be? You know, a, a AA is bigger than a AAA and a C cell and a D cell are bigger still. Well, really the, the chemistry inside them, the horizontal layout of these things is consistent across all those different shapes. Um, you just get basically wider and fatter disks. You get more material in them of the same chemistry. So you have the same voltage voltage end-to-end, -end, but you have a, a larger amount of the electrodes and the electrolyte, so you get more current uh, capability, you can push more current out of them, um, and you get additional capacity. Um, you might have several thousand milliamp hours in a D cell. That's why if you ever see like an old camping lantern or like one of those big mag light flashlights, they take, you know, C cells or D cells because they need to want to push a bunch of current out of them. These days they'd probably take a lithium battery, but back in the olden day they would take a C cell or a D cell. Um, little fun fact, a 9 volt battery, right? So everything else we said is a volt and a half. How can a 9 volt battery be 9 volts? Inside this 9 volt battery are actually six 
quadruple A batteries um, that are slightly smaller than a triple A. You can sort of see how two triple A's wouldn't quite fit side by side in there. Um, a nine volt battery has six quadruple A cells all stacked up in series to make that nine volt form factor. That's partly why these have a fairly high internal resistance because of course any current that's gonna flow through this nine volt is gonna have to sort of pass through six times the length of one of these batteries, so to speak, six times the amount of material to get those electrons out. Um, or get those electrons to circulate. And so the, the internal resistance of these tends to be fairly high for that reason. I was planning to cut this open um, and show you this, um, but uh, I discovered it's the last one I have in the house. And given how fast our smoke detectors have been dying, I would hate to be stuck in the middle of the night without a spare nine volt battery. So if you're curious, Google nine volt battery quadruple A and check that out online <laughs> because it's a demo that I'm not gonna sacrifice my sleep at two in the morning one of these days just to cut this battery apart, I don't think. Um, Oh, Kenneth notes, there are some 9 volts that are a custom vertical stack of cells that look like Pez. That's cool. I've never seen that. Hmm. Maybe we should cut this open. Let's think about that. I might have to make some choices, but um, that's neat. Um, We talked about quadruple. Oh, here, I, I threw a little picture in here. So um, this is the sort of classical 9 volt battery shape, at least that I've seen. Maybe there's fancier ones out there where you snip it open and you see there's sort of these six little individual cells that are soldered together with little tabs and sort of poke out to the terminals at the end. So anyway, little fun 9 volt battery fact. Um, Travis asks, why are they 1.5 volts? It has to do with the, the chemistry that's going on inside the cells themselves. So you have typically, I want to say like a manganese zinc electrodes in these. Oh, I might... I might be wrong about that. Um, oh, here, you know, actually, it's it's reflected in one of my images coming up later. Oh, no, that's a lead acid battery. Um, you you basically have a pair of, I'm, I'm gonna mangle the chemistry, so any chemists out there, feel free to jump in and tell me that I'm wrong. Um, but you have a chemical reaction going on between the anode plate, one of those metal plates, and the electrolyte, and between the electrolyte and the cathode plate, whichever one I didn't say earlier. Um, and that those chemical reactions themselves release energy. And that energy is comes it becomes a voltage at the, the output terminals. Um, it basically imparts a, a small amount of energy to the ions that pass back and forth between those two plates in such a way that the only way for that chemical reaction to continue is if electrons are flowing from one terminal to the next. And it's just the, the actual chemicals that are used and the chemical reactions that are taking place affect the amount of energy that's being passed back and forth. And that's where 1.5 volts come from. I think Kenneth, Kenneth is noting as well in the chat that like it will vary based on the chemistry going on. So for alkaline batteries, that nominal voltage for, for all standard purposes is 1.5 volts. But for another type of battery, like a lithium primary cell, um, it can be different. Um, so I, the, I think the main place that people are familiar with lithium batteries with is in rechargeable situations. But you may also have seen something like this picture here, which is Energizer Lithium. Duracell makes a lithium battery. These are batteries with lithium-based chemistries uh, that cause them to put, output a voltage, and they've built them into a AA or AAA form factor just for, for ease of use. Um, Lithium primary cells can have a voltage between 1.5 and 3.7 volts, depending on the actual specifics of the chemistry that's going on inside them. Um, so one formulation using a lithium compound as that electrolyte um, causes the output voltage to be about a volt and a half. So they make a really nice drop-in replacement for your classic alkaline double A's. Um, the advantage of them is that they tend to reduce in capacity less at higher currents compared to alkaline batteries. So this Energizer one for specific, I looked up um, at an amp of current, it will still have a capacity of about 2,500 milliamp hours. Um, whereas at 50 milliamps, it might be 3,000 milliamp hours. This lithium compound is just better at maintaining its capacity at higher currents. They're also more expensive. Um, but if you're looking for like, oh, this, my, my Game Boy is running out too fast, um, a lithium compatible AA, or a lithium AA compatible, I should say, is usually a drop-in replacement at a volt and a half for a regular double A. There are other lithium primary cells and there's lots of lithium chemistries as we'll see, um, but I haven't, all the ones that are sort of in common sizes are 1.5 volts um, be just because you don't want to accidentally blow something up. Um, the other place that you see lithium primary cells is in coin cells or button cells um, or watch batteries. Sometimes people call these and I have a whole pile of them here. Let's see, there's one. Get, get out of here alkalines. We're done with you for now. 
Uh, I got one. Got these guys. What else do I got? I got these guys in here. I'm gonna pull these out of my little voltmeter. So these are uh, coin cells or button cells. These actually come in multiple chemistries in these form factors. Um, but a lot of them, you can see this one here just says, I'm a lithium battery. I'm a CR2450 and I'm a three volt cell. So this is a lithium, probably a lithium silver battery um, that has had its chemistry adjusted to be at three volts. Um, this one in here is a CR2032, which is a really common um, coin cell form factor battery. And again, it says lithium battery, three volts. Um, these come in, in all kinds of form factors and sizes, um, and sometimes a variety of voltages. Um, you often see little tiny button cells um, used for powering uh, hearing aids or microphones. In fact, the little capsule mic that I use to do these things has a little button cell in it because it, a battery has to fit inside of this amplifier unit. Um, and so there's a little tiny button cell in there. I wonder, well, if I unscrew it, I think I'm gonna lose my sound, but you can trust me on that. Um, so these are lithium batteries that are non-rechargeable in most cases. Um, they are a primary cell chemistry. The nice thing about the, um, the lithium silver ones, and they won't typically tell you if it's lithium silver, um, but, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, um, they have a relatively low self-discharge rate. So you see these in places where it's important to have a consistent flow of power for a long period of time, like in clock modules. Um, this is uh, a really simple module. I think I bought at Micro Center a long time ago um, that has this little DS1307 chip on it. And you have something like this inside of basically every computer. Um, you will have a little tiny battery and its only job is to keep track of what the current time is, like literally the time of day. So when you turn your computer back on and the computer already knows, oh, it's it's Tuesday morning at 8.37 a.m. That's because there's been a, there's a little tiny battery in there that's just feeding little sips of power to your computer, to the computer's chip that remembers what time it is. Um, in a laptop, I actually don't know if they would often have a separate battery for that or not, but certainly in a tower um, or an old plug into the wall style computer from back in the olden days, I guess, um, you would have one of these little coin cell batteries. Um, it's often called the CMOS battery. Um, and when that died, your clock would no longer keep time when your computer turned off. Um, there's actually, I know Palmer ran into um, a question about this. He had a CMOS battery that was doing part of the job of maintaining um, the internal clock and memory state of a piece of gear he worked at at the Shakespeare Theater here in Chicago. Um, and we were really afraid of, we, we didn't know if that battery was good or not because that gear had been there for 10 years, which is not an unreasonable life for a CMOS battery, but it's sort of questionable. And we are worried that if that battery ever died and the unit became unplugged, would we lose all the programming inside of that unit? And we didn't really have a great way of test. And I think both of us left that company before we ever found out. So CMOS batteries turn out to be pretty important. Um, watch batteries, you might also hear these sometimes called because they're meant to fit, you know, inside of your watch. Um, so the, I'm not gonna go super deep into the nomenclature of what the various numbers and letters and batteries mean, because sort of beyond our scope tonight. Um, but one thing to note, if you're looking at button spell cell specifically, I mentioned like this one earlier, is a CR2032. Um, the C designation means that it's a lithium battery and the R just means round shape. Um, the L would imply that it's an alkaline battery and therefore probably one and a half volts, whereas most of the lithium cells are three volts. Um, just something to look out for. It'll tell you on the packaging or um, often you'll, you'll need a specific battery and you'll know what you're looking for, but just a little tidbit for what you're looking at when you see a, a coin cell battery. Here we go, yeah, so it's that again. Um, mostly three volts, um, lithium silver is low self-discharge, so like these things could be sitting around for years and years and not run themselves out, which is really great. Uh, I didn't really talk about their output capability. Usually it's very, very low. Like these are meant to, um, to hit their maximum current capacity um, at like, I don't know, four milliamps, five milliamps. Um, they're really meant for low current applications like a watch, like feeding one chip on a computer to remember the time. Um, you're not gonna be powering huge projects out of these. The place where I see people get into trouble, there we are, with this is, um, that I have seen at least um, since uh, as a, a theatrical lighting person in a former life, I, uh, I have seen people get into trouble with um, circuits that involve these to drive portable, say, electronics or LEDs or fairy lights, those little strings of twinkling LEDs so you can sort of wind around things. Some of those are, you know, when you order them from eBay or Amazon, come with uh, button cells, often CR2032 cells powering them. 
And the thing you have to watch out for is sometimes in the really, really, really cheap ones, that circuit is actually relying on the fact that these batteries can't put out a whole lot of current to protect the LEDs. The same way that we've been putting a resistor in front of our LEDs to make sure we're not passing too much current through them and blowing them up, they will just say, hey, my battery's never gonna provide more than five milliamps. Uh, a resistor is half a cent. I'm not going to spend that. This thing only cost me three bucks. Um, so when you go to rewire them into a power supply or a wall ward or a bigger set of batteries, because, for example, you want I, um, Iris's dress, uh, the Greek god Iris, to be covered in fairy lights and twinkling, um, you wire it into a big, nice, rechargeable battery pack on your actor's hip, and your LEDs all burn out because um, your whoever manufactured that product assumed it would only be run from little shitty coin cells instead of from an actual battery pack. So, excuse me. A thing to watch out for there. The same is actually true of 9-volt batteries. Um, I don't see it as much because 9 volts can source some current, um, but sometimes you will see a device that says, hey, I'm only going to ever have a 9-volt battery in me. I know I'm not going to pass too much current through it, so current limiting, the battery can handle that. Not good design, but in commercial applications, cheap design sometimes wins over good design. Um... Oh, we talked a little bit about internal resistance earlier, but I thought I would just sort of call it out here. Um, uh, a battery, and really all voltage sources sort of act like, we, we've been saying like, hey, this battery puts out a 1.5 volts, or this battery puts out 9 volts, or whatever it is. Um, and one way you can sort of think about that is, you know, this is a, an ideal um, 1.5 volt source that's going to make its two terminals different by a volt and a half no matter what. And then right in series with that is a little tiny resistor. That resistor is, of course, physically inside of all these batteries, um, but it sort of represents the internal impedance to electrons and ions flowing back and forth nice and cleanly. Um, and so when you're figuring out the maximum current that you can sort of draw out of a battery, or, or the maximum power at least, um, you can think about these, these batteries having an actual in tiny internal resistor to them. Some, some um, battery data sheets will actually call out what the internal resistance of a battery will be. Um, and as Kenneth noted a little bit ago, um, when you discharge a battery at a really high rate or charge it at a high rate, the battery will get warm. That's because that current flowing through that sort of virtual resistance creates heat, just like any other resistor would. So sometimes that's a useful parameter to sort of add into our calculations as we're thinking about how much current can we draw out, how much heat are we going to release, that kind of thing. Just a term of art that we, we may see around. That's all we're going to talk about for primary cells. Um, alkalines and lithiums are really the, the two that we, we see most commonly nowadays. We could talk about Leiden jars, which like glass jars that have foil on the inside of them, but I, I, I don't think it's really particularly necessary. Um, but we're going to jump right over to... Um, to rechargeable cells. We're also, I'm gonna say, wow, we're like half an hour into this thing. We're gonna blow through all these battery types um, and then we're gonna look at how you actually hook a battery up to an Arduino um, using some of the example batteries that are crowding the table behind me. So let's blast through it. Um, rechargeable batteries, lots of different types. NICADs are kind of passe, um, nickel cadmium batteries. You might have seen these if you had an old Makita drill, if you had an OG cell phone. Laptops had these as their sort of battery form factor for a little while. They're not great capacity compared to either alkaline or lithium batteries. Um, you do still see some sometimes in hobby use because they have a low internal resistance, um, so you can get a lot of current out of them. Um, but uh, you sometimes see them also in like battery backup systems in buildings still. Um, but for how heavy they are um, and how low power density they are, they're, they're not really used very much anymore. Um, in fact, in some places, I want to say in Europe, um, you, can, you can't uh, order or buy general purpose NICAD batteries anymore. Like you couldn't go and buy one off the shelf. You have to have a special purpose for them before you can even manufacture them. Because um, cadmium is not a super great element to have floating around. Um, in the environment anymore. Um, mostly they have been supplanted by this type of, of rechargeable, the um, NIMH, the nickel metal hydride battery. Um, and I should say both of these, uh, unlike alkalines, have a nominal cell voltage of around 1.2 volts instead of 1.5. But for most devices, you know, uh, your, what do we still have that's around that's battery powered? Like this microphone that I don't use, for example, um, which has a little double A cell in here, um, just hanging out. This is a non-rechargeable 10 energy AA cell, right? So in theory, this will put out up to a volt and a half, but the circuitry in here knows like, hey, as I use this thing, that voltage is gonna fall to 
1.2, 1.8 volts. So whatever is in here is assuming that that voltage is going to drop by quite a bit and it will still be made to work. So for those reasons, um, a nickel metal hydride battery that starts at 1.2 volts is probably gonna work fine in most applications where it's replacing a, an alkaline cell in like an end user product that's been designed around that range of voltages to begin with. It's important to remember, you know, as we're crafting our own solutions though, um, like are you, if you have a double A battery holder, is it gonna have alkaline cells in it? In which case, you know, let's say we had four alkaline cells, that could be as high as six volts. If I'm only ever gonna use nickel metal hydrides, that'll be like 4.8 volts max. So do we need to sort of like limit our types? Should we design our circuitry to be safe? By the way, that's the right answer. Um, so um, the fact that they are lower in voltage doesn't necessarily mean they're lower in um, in capacity. You can see these Energizer ones here are 2,400 milliamp hours at 1.2 volts, which is not too shabby. It's also much higher than nickel metal cadmium, nickel cadmium batteries. So a huge leap in technology there. Um, the chargers for these are not a super simple device in terms of their internal circuitry. As an end user, you just plug the batteries in and they charge. Um, but there are a few stages to charging a nickel metal hydride battery. Um, not that that terribly affects us as, uh, as makers, unless you're building your own battery charger, uh, but may affect the cost of one. So NIMH is sort of the common consumer level rechargeable alkaline replacement. Um, lead acid batteries are, are kind of fun. Um, lead acid batteries, and actually this is the this is the one that I have a diagram of from earlier in the evening, um, have a, a plate of lead as one of their electrodes and a plate of lead oxide, is PB and PBO2 are their two, their two um, electrodes they're sitting in there. And they're sitting in a vat of sulfuric acid, this H2SO4, and that's what's mediating the ion flow um, in between these two electrodes. Um, so inside a lead acid battery, of which sort of the canonical example is like a car battery, um, there is a pool of dilute sulfuric acid sitting among plates of lead and lead oxide, which is kind of wild. Um, they, as you can imagine, as a battery that contains lead, are super heavy for how much power they hold. Um, it's literally a box of lead and water and acid. Um, so for how much charge and how much energy you can pull out of them, um, they're really freaking heavy. Um, compared to uh, a composition like lithium with a graphene substrate, that's a super light battery for how much power it holds. Um, so why would we ever use them? Well, they're dirt cheap. Um, and they can provide a lot of surge current. Um, for a car battery, mostly what you're using is that you're using that car battery to uh, turn the whole motor over once so that internal combustion can begin and things can start running on their own. So you need a really high current, like hundreds of amps for a very short amount of time. And that's something that a lead acid battery is actually really good at. Um, and because they're everywhere, we make millions and millions of them a year worldwide, they're relatively cheap. You know, you can get a yeah, you know, 90 amp hour car battery for you know 100 bucks, 150 bucks. Um, even a even a decent one, 200 bucks. A decent being you know how good is the warranty on it most of the time. They're also easy to charge. Um, it's relatively easy to make a circuit, you know, based on a, an alternator in your car that generates uh, the appropriate voltage you just to put some energy back into this lead acid battery. Um, so that's a nice plus. Um, uh, you do want to have a situation where you trick, you're doing a proper charge of a lead acid battery, I should say. There are multiple phases. Um, and if you have an, a nice an external lead acid battery charger, um, it will have multiple modes of a constant current section, and then a constant voltage section. And then, then it will trickle charge, where it just puts a very small bit of power in forever to help it not self-discharge and that kind of thing. But the circuit in your car can be a lot simpler than that. Um, one... Uh, Feature or disadvantage, depending on how you look at it, is the state of charge of a lead acid battery uh, ref is reflected very directly in its output voltage. Um, so a a fully charged, a 12 volt lead acid battery um, is usually in the range of 13.2 to 13.8 volts. You see each cell, each individual slice of a lead acid battery is between two and 2.4 volts. Um, uh, depending on how charged it is. A fully charged cell may be 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 volts. We put six of those next to each other to get our 12 volt cell, and when it's fully charged up, we're talking 13 plus volts. As that battery gets decharged, decharged, discharged, that voltage ramps down in a really linear way. And so it's really easy to tell how charged or dead a lead acid battery is. You just put a voltmeter on it, which is 
it's not not always great that, that voltage is falling off because that means you get sort of less voltage over time but it makes it really easy to say hey this battery is this one's alive that one's dead um, if you discharge a lead acid battery too much it will be dead forever there's actually you know as you as you discharge a lead acid battery, the lead electrode actually disappears, gets electrolyzed, gets turned into lead oxide to build up on another plate. And if you discharge it too far, if you draw too much of the power away, you won't have enough lead or enough lead crystals on your anode, cathode, on one of your plates to be able to reform that electrode when you reverse the current into them. So if you've ever had a situation like I did a few months ago, where you leave your headlights on overnight and you come back out and your battery's measuring, you know, four volts, where it should be measuring 13 plus volts it not only is it dead but it probably is damaged um, you will probably be able to get enough of a jump to like get your car to say the auto zone just being from experience um, but really you have done damage to that battery by stripping so much lead out of those plates that you aren't, aren't going to be able to reform them in the same way that you once did um, one term of art that I want to call out here before I, I jump to a couple questions or things that are happening over on the side in chatty land here because um, you see this term a lot, is sealed lead acid battery or SLA battery. Um, lots of lead acid batteries like you'd find in a car actually have little ports on the top that you can pour additional uh, distilled water into to top off their fluid levels to sort of, uh, you know, if your sulfuric acid is drying out on the inside, you can top them up. You also have sealed lead acid ones that do not have those ports that are sort of self-regulating on the inside. Um, that, that don't ever need fluid topping off. That means there's also not a risk of you spilling sulfuric acid on yourself um, when things uh, go sideways, literally. Let's see what's going on over here in chat's land. Let's see. Certain wireless, menu, wireless microphone manufacturers have menu options to define which battery type you're using so the battery is correct. That's kind of cool. Yeah, battery metering is its own challenge. That's why something like a lead acid battery, you know, can be convenient for some applications because you can say, hey, when fully charged, I know this battery, when I'm not drawing any power out of it, you know, idles at 13.5 volts and I'm now seeing now it's 12.8, that's pretty discharged. I'm going to charge it right back up. Um, there are chemistries and lithium that we'll get to in just one second here is one of them where that voltage tends to be really steady and then right when you hit the end of its capacity it falls like a brick which is really handy from a circuit perspective right we know we have a consistent voltage on our battery but it's also really tricky because it means we need a more complicated way of determining how much life we have left in our battery we there's a lot of strategies for it you could um, basically make a circuit that measures the current at all times coming out of that battery and sort of integrate over time. You know, say, well, if I have, you know, 3,000 milliamp hours of capacity and I know how many milliamps I've been drawing for how much time, you can sort of estimate how much capacity is left. Um, you might also watch for that, like, that drop-off right at the end. There is that sort of a little knee as things start to fall that at least tells you that you're almost dead, um, but more complicated for other chemistries for sure. Travis says, what causes the off-gassing in a lead-acid battery? So, I believe it is mostly to do with a charging state. So if we go back to, and Kenneth will probably have the real answer in here, um, that, which would be great. Um, if you look at this diagram of, let's come to the here, uh, of a lead-acid battery cell, um, what you have is a uh, mediation of um, hydrogen, uh, sulfuric acid, hydrogen sulfide, uh, anions are negative cations i'm not going to try and get the terminology right negative ions flowing uh to the cathode and positive hydrogen ions flowing back so you're you're generating hydrogen ions in solution as you're charging the device um, if you overcharge to the point that you're, you're trying to release more hydrogen than can be absorbed by the lead oxide plates as electrons are returning to them in the charging process, then that comes off, I believe, as elemental hydrogen. That's my, like, layman's understanding uh, of, um, of how that process works. And I might have the whole thing totally backward, like which way the hydrogen goes or whatnot. Um, but that is why when you're jump-starting a car, all the instructions will say, you know, you hook two of the clips to one of the batteries and you hook the other clip, usually the, the dead car clip, to the positive and to the frame. And you always do that frame connection last because that's when your circuit is complete. And you don't want to be creating a spark near where, I mean, near the engine in general where there might be flammable things happening. But especially if you've really been messing up your battery, there might be hydrogen gas inside that battery and you don't want to be making a spark near elemental hydrogen gas. That's my understanding of that process. Um, but I, of course, would be happy to be wrong. Mm. 
I think I am wrong. Kenneth says you crack the water into H2 and O2 and sulfuric acid can come off as a vapor. So it's not, that's, that's not hydrogen at all. For some reason, I had always thought it was like hydrogen gas that was coming off, but like I say, happy, happy to be wrong as always. Chris says we had to deal with a lot of lift batteries that have died. Yeah. Yeah. As, as lead acid batteries die out, as you over, as you over discharge them, lead acid batteries are most often, I think, damaged by over discharge. Those, the lead plates essentially to allow these, these crystals of lead and lead oxide to deteriorate and sort of turn into each other. The structures inside are sort of not flat plates, but are sort of crenellated to allow lots of surface area, to allow lots of crystals to form. And once you deplete them enough, you don't sort of have that structure anymore. There's really no Coming back. It actually kind of segues into sort of the next slide about the sort of two different kinds of lead acid batteries that you'll see, at least in sort of the like commercial world, um, starting batteries and deep cycle batteries. So a starting battery is mostly what you see um, in a car. Um, where you really you need a, a large burst of current at one point to sort of get things moving, um, but they're really not designed to be run down through a lot of their capacity. In fact, for a, a starting battery, you usually don't see them listed with a you know milliamp hours or amp hours capacity at all, um, because they're intended to be used to provide you know, several hundred amps of current for a few seconds to get things started, and that's it. Um, they have. Uh, very thin plates of lead, but therefore lots and lots and lots of them can be spaced close together. So you have a lot of this surface area of lead that can be turned into lead oxide very quickly to give you a lot of current, but you can't run it very long or draw too much down on that capacity because you start damaging those plates relatively quickly. The other end of the spectrum is these deep cycle batteries that you may have heard about. I, I see deep cycle tossed around a lot when we're talking about lead acid batteries. Um, those have plates that are less numerous but quite thick, and so you can use a lot more of their capacity before you're sort of in damage, uh, in sort of in danger of damaging them. Um, but of course, because there are fewer plates and less surface area, you can't pull as much instantaneous current out of them. Um, there are also uh, these are sort of the ends of a spectrum. There are batteries um, sometimes just called lead acid batteries, um, sometimes now called hybrid batteries for specific applications that fall somewhere in between. They can pull a decent amount of current out at one point and can use a fair amount of their capacity. Um, and if you are building something, that's actually not, it's, it's worth thinking about, you know, do I ever need to draw tens of amps? Um, if not, a deep cycle battery might be the way to go. Anyway, that's lead acid. Let's get into lithium because I really want to start building some things tonight and we're already 10 minutes in, crazy. Lithium chemistries are all across the board. I'm not even going to try and cover all of them because, frankly, I don't understand all of them. We're just going to hit on a few major types um, and some of their advantages and disadvantages and challenges. Um, lithium ion is kind of a catch-all term because, of course, all of these things have lithium ions, uh, you know, charged atoms or molecules floating around inside them. Um, when you see a battery marked lithium ion, it actually might be sort of any type of lithium. Um, some, uh, sometimes lithium ion though is used specifically to refer to a lithium battery that has a liquid electrolyte as opposed to a uh, polymer or um, iron oxide electrolyte, which are sort of more specific types that we'll see in a sec. Um, most lithium batteries of, of this sort of basic type have a nominal voltage of about 3.7 volts per cell at full charge. Um, they are relatively easy to charge based on their chemistry, um, although you, you should be very careful about not overcharging them, and that's why uh, many, if not all, lithium batteries now um, have some safety and protections built into some circuitry in the battery itself. We'll see that on the table in a moment. Um, they're really high capacity for their weight. So they're sort of the opposite end of the spectrum from lead acid. Um, a three amp hour battery might be, you know, measured in tens of grams, which is really kind of uh, amazing. They're relatively expensive. They're not super easy to discharge of appropriately because you can't just throw lithium in a landfill. And uh, if you break them open, they can be a fire hazard because lithium, when it's exposed to water or vapor in the air, uh, can catch on fire. Um, so a thing to be aware of. The most common form factor by far for lithium batteries, I hope I'm not talking out my butt. I guess the ones that are in cell phones probably aren't this and they, they might actually make a significant dent, but for our purposes, the most common thing you see is this form factor, which is an 18650, 18650. See, it says right there, 18650. This one's from Ultrafire, which is a reputable brand. I recommend them. Um, and you can see it's a 3000 milliamp hour battery, 3.7 volts lithium ion. Um, and I don't know if you can tell, but right here at the end, you might see in the light there, it's got this sort of dimple, this sort of divot right at the end. There's actually a little circuit board at this end that sits between the bulk of the battery itself and the positive turn 
terminal. And that circuit board does a lot of great things for us. Um, it prevents over discharge. So when the voltage drops so low that the lithium part itself would be in, in danger of being damaged, it cuts things off. Um, it prevents overcharging. So, right, so if this reaches its full capacity and you continue to apply current to the lithium part itself, you can cause it to be either damaged or catch on fire. Um, if you don't have protection built in. So there's typically protection um, built into that cap. I should say not every 18650 has that. You can get raw 18650s. You can also get cheapy Chinesium ones that don't have this full protection. So when you're buying these batteries, I recommend buying a, a decent brand. Ultrafire is pretty good. Um, Samsung also makes some reputable ones. Um, just because you don't want to find yourself in a situation where this is charging, say on your workbench or out in the garage, and uh, it's a sketchy battery and it suddenly catches fire. Um, it's really would be a, a really bad day. Um, so mostly a thing that I don't worry about working with something like an, a, a branded ultra fire battery, but just know there is a, ch a fire hazard when charging any lithium battery, um, whether uh, when it's charging or honestly in use, like if we were to crack this open, there is a chance that it would catch fire and that wouldn't be super fun. Um, so when you're thinking about putting something uh, in a corner of your house where you don't see it, um, or in a place that is n f surrounded by flammable materials, um, think carefully about whether lithium is the best choice. Um, let's see. Chris points out, oh yeah, yeah, so I meant to mention this. So 18650 actually refers to the dimensions of this battery. Um, it's 18 millimeters by 650 millimeter, 1.8 centimeters by 650 centimeters long. Um, it is by far the most common form factor. There's also a 24650 that's two, a little bit thicker. It's 2.4 centimeters by 650 centimeters long. And there's also, there's an 18... Somebody help me out. There's an 18300 something, which is like the same diameter, but like squatter. Um, all 3.7 volts, that's again a, a function of the chemistry that's going on inside here, but would have different uh, current capabilities and different capacities as well. Um, I'll tell you what, I see lots of good things happening in the chat. I'm gonna blast through the last two battery chemistries and then we can chat about some stuff and we can build some stuff too. Uh, so lithium ion, kind of a catch-all term. Lithium polymer is a subset of lithium ion batteries, lipo batteries, you might have seen them called, um, or lipoly, or lip, or all kinds of things. Um, and that just refers to the fact that the, the, the electrolyte, remember that fluid that's mediating the flow of um, ions back and forth between the two terminals of the battery, in this case is a polymer gel instead of purely a liquid inside there. Um, they tend to have really high capacity for their weights and really high current capabilities. Um, you can see like this is um, a, a hobby battery like you might put in an RC plane or an RC car. Um, this one is a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. Um, the Turnigy 5.0. Turnigy is a pretty common brand that you see like in the hobby space for some of these things. Um, and uh, the last time I want to talk about before I talk about a couple of the parameters for specifying, especially a lithium ion battery, is the lithium iron phosphate, the LIFEPO battery, L-I for lithium, F-E for iron, P for, P-O-4 for, for phosphate, the LIFEPO battery. Have a slightly lower nominal cell voltage, about 3.2 volts, um, which uh, like all lithium batteries doesn't really decrease as you deplete the battery over time, which is nice. Um, by dint of their particular chemistry, a six cell LIFEPO battery ends up being about 12.8 volts. And if you recall, a, uh, a 12 volt lead acid battery is going to be in 12.8, 13.2, 13.6. 13 so a lot of the places where we've seen these LIFEPO batteries used are as drop-in replacements for lead acid batteries. Not so much in things like cars, um, but in things like golf carts or um, motorized scooters or things like that, just because they're lighter and in a, you know, in a golf cart with a whole thing might weigh 400 pounds, having a battery that weighs, you know, 30 pounds as opposed to 80 pounds is actually a relatively significant savings. Um, they also tend to be a little bit safer when punctured than um, a, a generic lithium ion battery. So um, BioNO, I throw, throw a picture up up here, oh, I can get that out of the way. Um, BioNO is a pretty cool brand. They make lots of interesting compatible batteries at various voltages. Um, and I should say, you know, I don't know if you can see it down on the screen here, but this is a, a 12 volt, 15 amp hour battery. Um, it is just expected that you know when you're working with lithium that a 12 volt lithium battery is a 12 volt nominal battery, which in this case means, usually means 12.8 to 13.2. Now, there are some products out there that are true 12 volt 
battery-like sources that are, you know, a lithium battery that has a voltage regulator built into the device that's giving you a true 12 volts or a true 6 volts, um, no matter what the battery underneath it is doing. So when you're purchasing, it's worth looking out for like, hey, you know, this is a 12 volt lead acid battery. Oh, it's really going to give me 13-ish volts. Hey, this is a super cool lithium battery pack that's going to give me a true 12 volts, even if the lithium cells themselves are at 13 or 14. So worth watching out for there. Are we talking about true voltage output or a nominal voltage, you know, based on uh, a round number of, of voltage in our cells? Um, let's see here. I'm going to take some questions and I want to talk about some sort of battery specs for specking lithium batteries. I swear we're almost, we're almost through the slides tonight and we can sort of get back to the topic of like, how do you hook up a battery to an Arduino? But all kinds of good things happening over here. Let's see. Bum, bum, bum. Talk about duty cycles of a battery. Do all batteries have a duty cycle? Not so much. Um, there are the the total capacity of a battery. I kind of got this all already, but I'll say it out loud because my face is here. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the total capacity of a battery can be affected by the the sort of duty cycle you apply to it. Um, in the sense that drawing current out of a battery produces heat, and heat can reduce capacity. So when you see ratings for things like a double A, let me just show you. Um, let me pull up the data sheet for a double A battery and sort of show you how these things are specced. Um, I'm going to go to DigiKey, which is a great electronic supplier. I'm going to say AA battery, batteries, non-rechargeable primary battery. Let's get that out of there. How about a nice Panasonic P646ND, one of my favorites. Battery alkaline, 1.5 volts. Let's see if this will have our nice... Let's see here. Yeah, so... Down especially for alkaline batteries here, um, you, they define them, you know, in terms of, sort of total capacity and various things and dimensions, nominal voltage. But really what they do, because alkaline batteries especially are meant for consumer use, they actually put them through a series of tests replicating um, common use cases. So um, here's our, our remote control test. We're going to put this in the remote control of our TV. I'm going to put a 24 ohm load on it. Uh, I'm going to run it for 15, I believe this is seconds per minute eight hours a day. So if I'm understanding this right, they will put this in a machine that sort of, you know, a, uh, puts a 24 ohm load on it for a quarter of the time, 15 seconds per minute for eight hours and measures its total battery life until it falls below some set acceptable threshold. Similarly for lighting, we might have a slightly higher draw. We only have a 3.3 ohm load here, um, a toy, a radio. Um, so when they're testing these devices, they're doing them under something like real world conditions. Um, and if you work through the math, um, there, there can be a difference in terms of like, is this used seconds per minute? Is it used at a high current, but for, um, only a little bit of time? Like this is a 3.3 ohm load that's turned on until the thing turns off. You see, you get about seven hours of uh, 3.3 ohm loadness out of this AA battery. So, um, so there can be some effect on capacity other than that, other than like real strong heat excursions, um, which are probably not great anyway. Like if you pull a lot of current out of a battery, um, and you really get it hot, that probably affects things too. But other than that, not really, um, as Kenneth says. Um, let's see. Oops, I'm just showing you nothing over here now. There we go. Um, oh, 18350, maybe? I don't know what that other what that other kind would be. Mm. I, Kenneth has caught that. I, yeah, I, I made it a, a Spico. What's a verbal typo? A verbal typo. Made a verbal typo. That, yeah, it's a four cell, 3.2 volt cell. Is a drop in replacement for a six cell SLA. Mm. And yeah, Chris asks, why should you not mix battery types? So yeah, there's, um, if you have batteries that have different internal, oh, did I mess it up on the slides too? Oh, so it's a typo. There we go. Um, if you have different types of batteries with say different internal resistances, um, even if they have the same nominal voltage, then the way that you draw power out of them or draw current out of them won't necessarily be um, consistent between batteries. Um, and the way that they respond to those differences in current draw may not be entirely predictable. There's also, nowadays, there's not really that many different types of batteries that are dropping replacements for each other. Like, you pretty much have, the world has settled on um, alkaline batteries for... Um, non-rechargeable nickel metal hydride for rechargeable um, 
and lithium for other form factors. So it's really, you shouldn't mix, say you shouldn't mix rechargeable and non-rechargeable batteries. And since NICAD is gone, you're pretty much safe nowadays. You just don't mix those two types. Um, all right, a few battery specs, but you know, it's only been, <laughs> only been 15 minutes. It's amazing to me. I don't know how y'all feel. Y'all probably like get to the Arduino, but like, it's amazing to me how fast these nights go on my end. And I, I know I'm the one with the face on the screen and things, so maybe it's different, but like it, time really does fly. Maybe because we're having fun. Or I am, I guess. Um, I did want to take a hot second because these lithium power sources are super cool. And I've used a lot of them, you know, in like theater things and lighting applications and they're neat. And because they are sort of a thing that like makers and hobbyists have sort of glomped from the remote controlled plane and car world, there is some terminology that's unique to those ecosystems that's worth calling out just so you know what it is when you see it. So I took this Turnigy 5.0 battery that we I threw up earlier and just pulled its specs down just so we could look at them and sort of talk a little bit about the terminology. So straight off of the website from hobbyking.com, right? Min a minimum capacity, at least 5,000 milliamp hours. Super cool. Configuration. So this is one of these pieces of technology that's specific to um, the hobby lithium battery world. Um, it says configuration 5S1P, 18.5 volts, 5 cell. So there's a little bit of redundant information there. The 5S1P means that there are five lithium cells in series and one in parallels, or it's essentially it's one, it's one string. Um, so we have, we have five cells in parallel in series with each other. So we get 3.7 volts times five or an 18.5 volt cell. This one very handily, in its specs told us that, told us I'm 18.5 volt nominal cell. Some will just say, hey, I'm a 3S battery. Um, and you're sort of left to your own to decipher that, the, oh, that's an 11.1 volt nominal cell. Um, part of that's because like, you know, in the RC world, a lot of things are sort of sized to match each other. Like you get a 3S battery and you get a, a 3S capable motor controller and you don't need to know anything about voltage. They sort of pared down the terminology for you. Um, but for our use, when we're like making different things with them, just know uh, S is series and one is parallel. So say a, a 2S 2P battery would have two sets uh, of two lithium cells in series. We have two sets of those in parallel with each other to provide additional current capacity, say. That would be a 7.4 volt nominal cell. So S, P, series, and parallel. Constant discharge rate you'll see on the screen here, 20C and peak discharge of 30C. What is C? Well, oh, here's the yeah, so, uh, so C is a measure of um, continuous current draw. Um, and actually, sometimes you'll see continuous C and peak C listed separately. But the way that C is defined is your maximum current is equal to your capacity times your C value. So take this example, this Turnigy battery here. It's a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. It says in its specs it can do 20 C continuous, 30 C peak. Well, so wow, what does that mean in terms of actual current? Well, uh, I have a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. 5,000 milliamps times 20 means I have 100 amps continuous current or 150 amps peak current out of this battery. That's a wild amount of current. Um, and the reason um, that they sort of use this C value is it allows you to sort of compare relative current capacities between um, bridge. Um, whereas if you had, say, a battery that was a 5C, um, it would put out a relatively low amount of, of current compared to its storage capacity, right? So C is just, remember, is defined as max current is equal to capacity times C. The other place you see this C value is in relation to charging batteries. Um, you might say like, oh, this lithium battery can be charged at a rate of 1C. And then what that means is like, if you have a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, you can charge it at five amps. Um, if you can charge it at um, say one fifth C, uh, you can charge it, this battery at one amp. So C is this ratio between current and capacity here. Um, that's sort of unique battery. The other end of the spectrum is this 10 series, one parallel battery. That's 10 lithium cells all stacked up in series with each other. This is like a 37 volt nominal battery. Um, and then you can also, you have this parallel configurations, 1S, 2P. That's two cells in parallel, right? One in series, so just with itself, two in parallel next to each other. So that's a 3.7 volt battery with a little extra current uh, output capacity. Then you can see there this is a 90C discharge battery, which is kind of crazy. So that's a 6,400 milliamp current out of there for a short amount of time. Um, that's what C is. This is my reminder to hydrate, and you all should too. <laughs> Oh, man. 
Uh, because last week I did so much gosh darn talking that by the end of the night my throat was really raw and sore because I wasn't drinking any water. So I'll take a little hydration break um, and then we'll look at hooking some stuff up to an Arduino and that will be great. Oh, thank goodness. So let's get our Arduino on the table. Our Arduino Uno that we've been working with all these weeks. So the Arduino has a number of places that you can squirt power into it. Um, we have traditionally been powering it from our USB jack, which just gives us five volts out of the computer because that's the voltage that USB runs on. Five volts, well, that's the voltage that every USB before USB-C power uh, negotiation came into play. Um, but USB used to be five volts all day long. Um, so, um, which is great because that's the operating voltage of our of our Arduino Uno. We haven't really messed with this barrel jack yet, um, which if you haven't seen one, is this kind of connector that has a, a pin in the center, has another contact allowed on the outside here, and takes a connector like that one, um, where your outer contact plugs into that outer contact of that barrel jack, and your sort of inner metalized contact there connects to that connects to that pin. You can put a much higher voltage than 5 volts into this barrel jack and still have it run the Arduino for you. In fact, this is a, a battery pack that's meant to run off of a 9 volt battery, and I'm actually I'm glad we didn't cut that one apart earlier, or this wouldn't have worked. So, Kenneth is, uh, as usual, making fun, but... <laughs> fiery suggestions in the chat. So thanks, Kenneth. Chris says, all this battery talk, making a need to look at my battery choice for a motor I'm trying to power. Ooh, Chris, tell us more about this battery powered motor thing. I want to hear more. Cause that would be good fodder for like battery selection chat. I can get my nine volt battery plugged in here. Nine volt battery, not a great choice. I will say we'll get there. We'll get to why in a second, but uh, on but it should do. Yeah, there we go. So you can see my Arduino powers up just fine running off of nine volts. And that's because there is a voltage regulator on board. It's actually this little three pin down to five volts. So the rest of the system only sees five volts coming in from that barrel. The reason I should say that nine volts is not great for running this is the voltage on this is really going to start to sag um, and maybe dip below what we need to sort of power everything at once. You can get into this really unfortunate situation where you're running your code. Let's say, okay, at this point in my code, I turn on these six LEDs at once and all of them turn on for a second. And then they turn right back off because the Arduino has run out of voltage. That voltage has fallen below five volts. It's turned off. The LEDs turn off. The voltage comes back up. The Arduino general use case is not an ideal power source. Mm. Palmer points out, yes, um, barrel jacks can be um, either connector. For most connection, um, the, um, the audio pedal world is sort of the, the one big exception that I've seen where the outside shield is positive and the pin is negative. Um, yeah, or AC. Um, generally, yeah, generally it's a DC connector with positive on the inside. Although I'll tell you the biggest crime, I think I have it here. Yeah, <laughs> you want to see a real absolute abomination of a thing? So this, <laughs> at a conference a couple years ago. Um, so it just sits in this charging cradle, and it charges. It has a barrel jack going into the back. That barrel jack is 12 volts DC center positive. Um, so it expects 12 volts to be on the center pin and negative to be on the outer pin. And this is the connector on the other end of that cable, right? Positive, negative. The other end of that cable... USB, which has a USB, like a generic USB power brick, but is in fact a horrible, horrible abuse. <laughs> anyway, I'm really, I'm really quite mad about it. So anyway, um, for our purposes, if you have, right, we're going to take in some voltage that's above five volts and step it down. We're going to regulate it down to five volts. Why can't we put in 5.5 volts or six volts or 6.5 volts. Um, and it has to do with this regulator chip. Um, well, this might be a good segue into regulators, um, but that regulator is going to um, always burn up a little bit of the voltage that it's that sees coming in to regulate the voltage down to the, the level that you're using. This specific regulator, and there are some that do not do this, but in this case, you're always gonna lose at least a volt, volt and a half, two volt. I think it's about a, a volt and a half. 
um, maybe 1.2 volts. So the, the official recommendation is seven volts or above um, because that gives them you know, a little bit of fudge room to say, hey, you know, don't use six volts, use seven volts um, as your input here. I should also say, talking about the Arduino, so you can inject that voltage into this barrel jack, um, but let's say you're using a power source that doesn't have one of these nice barrel connectors on it. There is also a pin and it is, do you not get it as a broken out pin on the Uno? That's, oh, because you get it on the barrel jack. I should show you, might be time for tummy cam again. Here, hang on. <laughs> Trying to avoid tummy cam this week. I need to pull another Arduino out of a box. You hear me cronkling around in here? Yeah, there we go. All right, hang on. I thought that was a broken out pin. There we go. We're back. So, um, other variants of the Arduino, you get this pin, and you can see down in the corner here, called RAW. Can you focus on that? RAW. Um, the RAW pin on uh, this uh, Arduino Pro Mini, or the Nano, or various other form factors, functions the same way as this barrel jack, and then you can inject a higher than 5 volts voltage, and it, there will be a little onboard regulator. In fact, in this case, it's that little tiny device sitting right there on that little circuit board um, that steps that voltage down to 5 volts for you. If you inject your higher than 5 volts voltage into the 5 volt line, or the VCC line, or the V in line. Um, oh, maybe V in is the equivalent on the Arduino Uno. So the, uh, we should double check that. I think the, the V in is the equivalent of raw. Someone can Google that for me. Um, I've just been working with these pro mini so long after I forgot what it was called on the Arduino here. Um, yeah, Kenneth's got it. It's the V in pin. Um, so you can, you can inject a higher than five volts voltage up to about 12 volts in there and it will regulate it down for you at a cost because right, we're, we're, with a linear regulator like this, and we'll, we'll talk about regulators in just a sec, you are essentially burning off the additional voltage between your input voltage and your target voltage. Um, so if you are putting in nine volts and your Arduino needs five, you are gonna be burning off four volts at whatever amount of current you need to draw to sort of get rid of that extra voltage and take yourself down to five volts that it's applicable here. So it's not like you're getting that, that voltage difference for free. You're actually burning off the extra difference literally as heat in this case. It might be a good as enough time to, as any to, to talk a little about voltage regulators um, and what they are. They are a device that turns one voltage into another, more or less. Um, this is a really common one, the 7805. Um, the 7800 series is a really uh, long-lived and, and very common series of linear voltage regulators. Um, and uh, they come in all kinds of output voltages. So there's a 7803 that outputs 3.3 volts. There's a 7805, there's a 7808, 09, 7812, 7815 that output, you know, 9 volts, 12 volts, 15 volts, and so on. Um, they're really easy to wire up. You plug in your input voltage, goes into your, your V-in pin, your input pin on them, and ground. And you get on, on your output, you got your V-output pin and ground, you get 5 volts. You should also put a couple of capacitors on the input and the output side to keep this as stable as possible. If you have a voltage regulator around, you don't have capacitor to play with, just plug it in. It will probably be fine. It may be a little unstable. There may be some extra ripple. Um, but in most cases, it will be fine for experimentation purposes. Um, and this is exactly the kind of circuit that is on this Arduino Uno here. We have our three pins, one of which will be input, one of which will be our shared ground pin, and one of which will just be our 5-volt output that goes to the rest of the circuit. A really easy device to use. And these things are super, super cheap. Well, they're relatively cheap. But cheap enough that like I just <laughs> I just keep a bag of them on hand because um, I'm not sure you know I'm always gonna need to throw five volts at something. It's the LM7805. Um, you get them from DigiKey. Get them from Amazon. They're all super cheap. Um, but they are a linear regulator, so they are burning off as heat the voltage difference um, between your input voltage and your output voltage. Will the heat increase with a larger voltage drop or a larger current draw? Both. So uh, if you uh, we're stepping down from, say, 7 volts to 5 volts at uh, a given current, say 100 milliamps, you'd have a, a certain amount of heat. If you double your voltage difference, I believe you would double your heat output, and if you double your current, you'll double your heat output. I believe that is true. I believe, and I remember wrong, for a linear regulator, um, you basically, you follow that P equals IV law that we learned about a few weeks ago. So your power output is equal to your current times your voltage across the device. And in this case, the voltage across the device is gonna be equal to your voltage drop. <coughs> so 
in a situation where you're sort of really worried about power management, if you do need to have a linear regulator, it's good to get your output voltage and your battery voltage to be as close to them as possible. Um, so things like, things I have done would be something like two 18650 cells to power an Arduino, right? So these are 3.7 volts nominal. So 3.7 volts plus 3.7 volts is... Uh, 7.4 volts, just a little bit above the sort of regulated input that we want to see here. Um, and it put those together in series, stick it into the raw input here, and we have power. Um, you could also, you know, if you wanted a lot more current, uh, if you needed a lot more voltage somewhere else in your circuit, um, you could do something like put three lithium batteries in series that would get you up to 11.1 volts and still inject it in. I have done that for um, controlling 12 volt LEDs uh, in an Arduino powered circuit. So 11.1 volts close enough for my purposes. Also just squirt the 11.1 volts directly into the Arduino. Let it take care of regulating down um, that 11 volts down to the five volts that the Arduino needed. And in that situation, um, I was, wasn't was using the Arduino to draw a whole lot of power. I was using an external transistor to switch my LED on and off. So I really just had to power the Arduino processor itself. So at that handful of milliamps, you know, some power wasted burning off in this linear regulator was pretty much fine. Um, but, you know, if, if you have a choice, if it's just about powering the Arduino, keeping your source voltage close to your target voltage is a useful thing. So have less current or less power wasted um, in your voltage regulator. Um, if you're really worried about power savings, you might think about a switching regulator. Um, and these come in a whole bunch of types and species and looks. These are just some pictures that I pulled off of Amazon. In fact, this little, this little guy I've used a ton of. Um, and this one too. This one is a switching regulator with some additional controls built into the top. Um, without getting super deep into it, a switching, so a linear regulator acts kind of like a resistor does in that it burns off the excess, the excess voltage as heat. Um, whereas a switching regulator operates by an entirely different principle in that it, um, in the case of a buck regulator, which is the kind that steps the incoming voltage down, uh, to your target voltage. It's basically taking little sips of the incoming voltage and using that to charge a capacitor um, to the appropriate output voltage level. And then only sort of sipping from the input voltage when uh, it needs to sort of charge that capacitor more to achieve the target output voltage. Um, there is also, so that's a buck uh, converter, a boost converter, um, can operate in one of a couple of different topologies, but essentially takes the incoming voltage um, and um, using uh, an oscillator circuit, boosts its voltage up to the target output voltage. And then you can actually you can combine those two together to get what's called a buck boost regulator, um, which can take in a voltage that is higher or lower than its target output voltage. So you could say, hey, I want to see 12 volts out of this regulator. Uh, I could put in anywhere between three volts and 28 volts, give me 12 volts on the output and it will do it for you. Super, super handy. Um, and because they are either sort of letting um, a lot of current through when they're doing sort of these sipping operations, which is not a technical term for sure, um, or um, they are passing no current, right? When they are sort of not, not taking any current right now, or oh, I need a little bit, need a little bit. They're either sort of fully connected or fully opens or fully closed or, or fully not passing power. They're rarely in an inter intermediate state where they are wasting things as heat. And so these can be a lot more efficient in terms of voltage conversion than a linear regulator. Um, you know, something on the order of 60, 70, 80% efficient um, it, depending on your input voltage level and your output power and various things like that. These little chintzy modules from Amazon are not necessarily going to be that efficient, but they will still be um, more efficient and less hot than a linear regulator for a similar application. Let's see. Real quick. Um, I bought the few regulators for my ClearCom project. Oh, the ClearCom project. Yes, very cool. ClearCom provides 30 volts all the time. Why not use it? 30 volts in to 5 volts out. Would be better to switch to a 12 volt so they aren't doing as much burn. Think about a buck regulator. <laughs> yeah. So, Palmer, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question. Um, if you have a switching regulator, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference whether you're doing 30 volts in or 12 volts out versus 30 volts in and 5 volts out. They will be rel in the same range of efficiency. If you're using a linear regulator, 
which I, I don't know that you would necessarily use the right choice for this project for exactly this reason, um, you would want to go to a higher power level, um, or higher, higher voltage, I should say, um, for your, your output lights, um, because then, yes, you'd be wasting less voltage as heat. I would think um, you would want... Um, you would want a switching regulator for this though. If you're gonna step down voltage by more than half, switching is probably the way to go. Mm. Kenneth, I think I think Palmer's put, like saying on the output end, because he's got 30 volts in, and I think he's doing either a five volt or a 12 volt light source at the other end, like an, uh, either a pre-resistored or a made LED. Palmer, the other option would be if you wanted to roll um, a solution where you are driving your light directly off of the 30 volts um, would be a possibility. Maybe maybe a bunch of LEDs in series at a really low current. Just thought. Um, so, any case, lots of lots of really nifty um, buck and boost regulators, and there's some that come in from really neat form factors. Um, this is a, a buck regulator. Uh, it's a bunch of them actually on a circuit board that I bought for a uh, a project related to my tiny moving light project a while back. These actually snap apart. They're super cute. Um, they take, I think, up to 20 volts in and spit 3.3 volts out, if memory serves. Um, and they're super adorable. This whole strip of five cost me like a few bucks coming from China. Um, this is a little module that I got online. This is a 3.3 volt regulator that is meant to be, I believe pin compatible, I'm not, we should double check that, with the 7805, um, except it's a switching regulator, right? So if you had a circuit or a piece of electronics or, you know, a classic something, something you couldn't design from scratch, you're trying to fix up and you wanted to make it more power efficient, you could pop the old 7805 out of it and put one of these little tiny modules on a circuit board in its place with the same connections. There are also, let me see where I've stashed them. I have so much on this table over here tonight. There was a little tube of... Oh, I'm sure they're here somewhere. Um, there are now whole monolithic devices that are drop-in replacements for 7805s. Oh, here they are. In my bin related to that tiny moving light project, ironically enough. So this is the V7805 series. Um, they're expensive, but they are super adorable and they are literally meant to be pin compatible. So you pop this old part out, you pop this one in, and this is the switching regulator equivalent of this. So already, you know, we're, you know I was in a situation where I needed to be providing um, 11 volts to the end device because my LEDs had a forward voltage of somewhere around 11 volts, but I needed five volts available to drive some servo motors. So if I put a linear regulator in there and I'm gonna be drawing, you know, 400 milliamps at most, I'm going to be burning off a lot of power as heat with one of these. Or I can put this uh, expensive part, like a $4 part in there, and now I have like 90% efficiency dropping down from um, 11 volts to 5 volts. So you, you pay for efficiency with a lot of these things, but, um, but they are out there for applications like this. And I apparently have accumulated a, b a bunch of them over the course of time. Um, so let's, uh, let's wire one of these up and I'll show you what I mean. We haven't done any soldering here in a long time. Oh, here, I could probably, yeah, let's just do this. So, grab my circuit board, grab my regulator here, grab my power supply, grab some wire. Are you familiar with the, the, future, the Futurama segment where the professor notes that this is the drawer where he keeps his assorted bits of wire? Well, I have reached the point in my life where I now have not one, but two different bins where I keep my assorted bits of wire. <laughs> and I'm not too sad about it. <laughs> um, let's just double check my pin out here. Yeah, there we go. Input. Ground and output. So I'm going to turn on my power supply off screen here. I'm going to set it to, I don't know, eight volts. I'm going to hook up my ground. I'm going to hook up my, make sure this is the right part, LM7805. I think that's right. There we go. And then I'll come in here with my multimeter. Actually, this was a cute thing I built this week. This is a little, uh, a little three digit voltmeter that's sitting on top of its own little battery pack. Because I got tired of hauling out the full-size voltmeter for doing little easy measurements like this. Um, 
That turned out pretty cute. Now we can see, so the, the input here is at eight volts. Um, the output is at 4.6 volts, which is you know plus or minus 1% from five volts. So good enough for government purposes here. Um, and that's really all it takes. We, we, we are putting in you know, eight volts on the input. We get five volts on the output. The voltage regulator is doing its job. Now, if I turn the voltage up, we'll start to get additional heat production, which I, I know doesn't show up on camera here, but this thing will start to get warmer and warmer. Um, but of course that's proportional to the output load. And since there's very, very little load on the output right now, we're not gonna see a whole lot of, a whole lot of heat on the output there. Um, yeah, using a voltage regulator is as simple as that. Let's see here, if these are, are these really pin compatible? No, they're not. Oh, that's annoying. Um, turn my power supply off. Let's plug this guy in. and can see if we can figure out what output voltage it actually was. So this actually has its output pin in the middle, which is sort of inconvenient. But thankfully, I have more assorted bits of wire. Plug in B in, B out, and ground. We'll plug that in. Turn our power supply back on. We'll see. Okay, it's, look, it's got an adorable little red light to tell you it's got power going in. I'm getting 3.35. So this must be a 3.3 volt regulator, which I think is what we thought it was. Um, and again, it's a switching regulator. So it's going to be much more efficient for a given load than the linear regulator would be. Um, I should say, not that we're going to play with anything tonight, but just in like the broadening of your mindset of what, what regulators are out there. Um, these come in all different sizes. They come in larger versions with larger heat sinks or smaller versions for more compact uses. They come in surface mount. There's also the 7900 series. So this is the 7800 series, a 7805 positive voltage reference. There is also the 7905 where you put in a positive voltage and ground and you get out a negative five volt reference. Um, similar to 7912, it's a negative 12 volt supply. Really useful if you're doing um, audio circuits that need plus and minus supplies as opposed to just positive and ground. Um, or instrumentation where you might need a supply rail below your ground rail. Um, those, the, these are, they certainly exist in the, um, in the linear regulator space as well. So there's a thing to explore if you're playing with circuits that need a negative supply rail. Oh, let's see. Checking back in. Oh. Uh, Palmer, back on the Clearcom question. Um, to power the Arduino, I was wondering if I'd step from 30 to 12 on my own and 12 to 5 for the Arduino itself. Yeah, Kenneth Scott, yeah. Doing, a, doing as much as possible with the switching regulator will be as efficient as possible. Um, oh, Kenneth says the 7900 regulators take a negative voltage can turn negative 12 to be negative five ah okay so if you're if you have a negative supply rail let's say you negative 12 volts in and positive 12 volts in um, and a lot of like computer power supplies and things have negative and positive rails and you needed minus five volts the 7900 series could supply it thank you that's a good correction i have not worked with a negative supply rail driven device in I did some some experiments in the ham radio space with it like three or four years ago. And I honestly don't remember what I did to supply power to them. Like I'm looking at the box that they're still in up on my shelves here and I have no remembrance of that. So thank you. That's a good catch. Um, so uh, regulators, relatively simple to use, whether they're sort of encapsulated in one of these little adorable circuit boards or whether you're using a linear regulator like this. Um, there, there are common modules for this if you're doing sort of higher power things are sort of all over the internet now. Um, in fact, let me, I'll just show you. Let's go to Amazon. They're everywhere. Well, the switching, let's see, a new buck regulator, um, step down regulator. Uh, here, here's a pack of 10, 1.25 to 30 volts, three amp regulators for 18 bucks. That's just bonkers. Um, they, are, they are not super great. Like they say they are three amp regulators. Having used these um, to say power a bunch of uh, light up umbrellas in a show before, three amps is kind of pushing it, especially for long-term use. Um, you can try putting a little heat sink on the sort of chip here. Um, that helps some. Um, but these things have gotten just so darn cheap um, that it's, it's a really easy way to provide power. Here's a here's a what claims to be a 20 amp module um, for 18 bucks. And remember, these are all these are currently at least what I'm searching for since I'm searching for buck module. These are all step down, so you have to provide a higher voltage than what is being output to get there. So if I need five volts, um, you, I I would have to put in some voltage level above five volts to get there. And some of these will specify 
um, how much higher you need to go. Some of them will not. But given this one says, I don't know if you can see here, this one says 6 volts to 40 volts in, 1.2 to 35 volts out. So it looks like there's about a 5 volts difference between your input and your output. So if you're looking to get 5 volts, you might need to feed this from, say, a 10 or a 12 volt supply to get down there. Just a guess. Just a part I pulled up on Amazon. But, it, you know, that would be my my take on that. Um, that is the gist, at least, of voltage regulators. Um, questions? Comments? I, we've kind of been blowing through stuff, because like I said, I want to get to a, a few more things. Um, but that is the gist of it. Maybe we'll use one of these to power an Arduino when I can, I'll prove to you that it can actually be done. So let me turn the power supply off so I don't blow things up. We'll pull this out. We'll plug our 5 volt regulator. Let's go back to the table. So looking at the top of my head. Input, output, we'll grab another assorted piece of wire. And we'll grab a bit of wire to ground. And where did my ah uh, here, I'll tell you what. Let's use let's use this uh this Pro Mini, which is identical to uh to an Uno, except it's gonna plug in more nicely to my breadboard here. I'm gonna use that for the sake of this demo. Let's move things over a little bit. So voltage regulator, ground. And again, we'll have, so we'll have to um plug the ground connection into Arduino as well, so that uh, you know our five volts is going to be a, a sh uh, based on that ground level. Um, and so we're gonna have to plug in two wires to our Arduino, our ground pin and our uh, power pin. So I'm gonna plug the Arduino in there. I'm gonna connect my ground connection on the regulator to my ground point on my Arduino. And I'm going to connect the output section here to the out to the uh i'm going to do it to the v in pin vcc pin here on my arduino there we go now make sure the power supply is hooked up there we go when i turn this on hopefully nothing should blow up seems good although nothing is actually turning on which is a little disheartening let's take a look at the voltage here Five volts, let's see. I could shoot this into the raw section as well, although I don't have a... The other thing I guess I should have checked is that this uh, this Pro Mini was actually functional. I had a bad habit um, during the Big Fish uh, Firefly Ball project that I bought a bunch of these for of throwing the dead ones back into my storage bin. I can tell this is from that same project because I only bothered to solder some of the header pins onto it. So there is a possibility that this is a dead one. Oh, or that the soldering is really bad. That's what's happening here. Yeah, I don't know if you can see this here, but look at that ground pin. It's just like, what, what happened? It's just like hanging out above the block. Well, we can fix that. We'll do a quick solder because I really, you know, I realize we haven't really done that many things hands on this week, and so we'll just like we'll power an Arduino with an external regulator, which might be a thing you want to do as you step down to smaller devices for making more portable or power projects with battery power. So both this little Pro Mini, like the full-size Arduino Uno, has a regulator on it. But of course, it is a much, much smaller regulator. Um, and so it's going to be able to sustain much, much lower currents. Um, so if you needed to power a lot of things, a lot of LEDs, a lot of servos, sensors, what have you, the regulator on, say, something like a Pro Mini might not be able to sustain enough current um, for that application. So you might need to start thinking about adding an external regulator to your project um, just to make sure that you can power everything. Because the failure mode with these Pro Minis um, tends to be that their, power, their, their regulator burns out. It gets too hot, it's trying to do too much work, and it just smokes. Um, and then the thing doesn't work anymore, and that's a real bummer. Um, especially with the sort of cheaper, um, this is actually, this is OSEPP, they're a pretty decent brand, but especially with the sort of generic um, models that come out of uh, China and other places, um, their voltage regulators really are not particularly reliable. We'll try this one more time. If this doesn't work, we'll just write this off as dead. Oh, there we go. Well, if you can see, got a little red light. How exciting. So now we're, we're powering this Arduino directly from this 5-volt regulator, which is accepting currently about 10 volts um, from uh, my, my power supply off screen here. And we can see. I'll, sh I'll show you. I have the technology. 
plug this little guy. So on the input side here, you're getting 10.9 volts, almost 11 volts. And on the output side, if I hook this up to my VCC pin without shorting anything, you're getting five volts on the output there. It's just as simple as that. So that's going, you know, that'll eventually get a little bit of warm. It's getting a little bit warm now, although 80 milliamps, you know, that's it's drawing out of the power supply is not a terribly large amount of power as these things go. I'm not really worried about it. Um, but that is, uh, that's how you power an Arduino with an external linear regulator. Um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was young and foolish. This was like 2013, uh, 2014 that I was doing this Big Fest project and I just didn't, I just didn't know any better. What a fool was I. Um, yeah, keep it to a tight 90. Oh man, we're already, we're already into it. Um, Palmer points out very rightly that we skipped voltage dividers, which is how you measure a higher than five volts voltage with your analog read function. Let's jump to that now. So let's turn a couple things off so we do not catch them on fire, but let's keep this Arduino around. In fact, let's keep this linear regulator around too. This actually, this will be a great, um, uh, a great example board. So let's just make sure I have any of my analog pins soldered. I don't. We'll solder a little header on there. So let's see. So I am going to try and talk and solder at the same time. I need header pins. I need header pins. Well, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try and talk and hunt for header pins at the same time. Um, so. No, I'm not. I'm gonna try to solder this first, and then I'll talk to you. <laughs> I'll talk to you about uh, uh, voltage dividers um, after I do. But I'll put the slide up, and we can just sort of enjoy that it's there together. Um, I'll solder this in. The um, I just to tell a story, so it's not just you know hanging out. Um, this big fish project that I did, um, I got tapped into the pre-Broadway tryout of the Big Fish musical and it was here in Chicago, um, which was really exciting as like a 24 year old um, and also really crazy. Um, the thing that they they needed um, was in the scene where he visits the witch or the witches in the wood. Ooh, let's come over here. Um, they wanted the witches, all six witches to have little balls uh, of acrylic that would have fireflies, little light up fireflies appear inside them and sort of flicker and come to life. Um, and then the queen witch uh, would have um, a ball of fireflies that uh, on command would turn a magical blue color to signify that she was, I don't know, imbuing the, the lead character with magic or however that show goes. It's been a while. Um, oh, it's a really awful soldering job, but thankfully, can't see because you're far away. Um, and so I built a bunch of these little circuits that were based on these little Arduino Pro Minis because I, I didn't have the time or frankly the capability at that point to sort of roll my own like microprocessor solution. I sort of plugged into a circuit board, which I probably still have here somewhere, doesn't matter, um, with a little with some transistors on it and used those to drive pairs of external yellow LEDs um, and could make them sort of be pre-programmed like flash and twinkle. And then the, the queen witch's ball also had some blue LEDs in it that could flash and twinkle on command. Um, we wrapped them all up in um, first plastic acrylic um, like Christmas ornaments that like, came in a, a double clamshell. Um, and then when those started breaking, we found what were sort of like clear pet toy balls, like the raw part that makes an animal like dog chew squishy toy um, and like cut into those and turn those into a much more durable solution, which was pretty cool. Um, anyway, that was that project. That feels like about a thousand years ago because it was about seven years ago. So... I didn't really prepare to do this with the Pro Mini, but that is okay, because I think it's a more decent representation of how we would do this in real life. So the situation that I'm going to be simulating here is, let's say I have, um, let's, let's bypass a couple reasons why this might be how we set it up, but let's say I had a 12 volt lead acid battery in my car. This is a good example. Powering uh, my Pro Mini that was sitting in the car doing something. I don't know what, flashing some lights or playing some tunes or maybe my snake game was on the dashboard, which would be a really bad idea. Um, but for whatever reason, I have this Pro Mini sitting in the car and I, like I said earlier, the voltage on an SLA battery is directly related to 
uh, its state of charge. So maybe, as long as I have this Arduino here, I'm going to use it to monitor the, the voltage on my lead acid battery on the input. But that voltage is gonna be 12 and a half, 13, 14 volts, much higher than the five volts we can safely measure. How are we going to measure uh, say up to 15 volts, maybe to be extra safe, um, with a five volt capable Arduino. And this is how we're going to use a voltage divider. Won't go super deep into the math because I imagine that the math is not necessarily the most interesting part, but a voltage divider is a pair of resistors, typically in this case, Z1 and Z2, um, from which we tap a voltage out from this sort of middle point between them here. And that voltage on the output is related to the voltage on the input by the values of those resistances in that the output voltage is equal to the input voltage times the ratio of the lower resistance to the sum of the two resistances. Right? So if that all sounded like gobbledygook coming out of my mouth, this is the math here. Um, it's, it's, you take your input voltage, you multiply it by this lower resistor divided by the total resistance that gives you your output voltage. So let's say our input voltage is gonna be up to 15 volts um, and we want our output voltage to be no more than five volts. So we know this ratio should be no bigger than one third. We wanna take our input voltage and cut it by a third um, to get to our output voltage here. And when we work through the math, we should see that our, our, our one should be twice as big as R2. We should have, you know, two R up here and R down here. So for my example, I'm going to use a 20K and 10K as my resistances here, which means that when I get 15 volts in, I'll have five volts out. And we'll step it down linearly from there, right? When I put 12 volts in, I'll get four volts out. When I put nine volts in, I get three volts out and so on. So I'll sort of have this linear relationship between my input voltage and my output voltage. So I'll sort of get a scaled representation of what my input voltage is here, if that sort of makes sense. I did I try to turn on the fume extractor. I'd be happy to turn on my fume extractor. I think it's going to make a really awful sound in my microphone. How's that? Is that good? Is that good for everybody? Maybe it's not so awful, but it sounds awful here. I have a 120 volt muffin fan in my fume extractor because all fume extractors suck when you get them. Um, but this one works pretty well now. Uh, the 120 volt fan that I uh, took home with me from striking the musical million dollar quartet in Chicago here, of all things, a, a well storied fan in that solder extractor. So um, what I'm going to do is set up my voltage divider here on my workbench. I have a bunch of 10K resistors. Let's zoom out just a little bit here. A bunch of 10K resistors that I'm gonna to use to make up a 20K resistance and a 10K resistance. Use these big boys because I don't know what else I'm ever going to use them for. Um, so my voltage will be coming in here from my battery, and in my case, I'm going to use my my power supply. Um, so I want to set it up so that I've got uh, 20k of resistance, and then a voltage output, and then 10k of resistance, and then ground. So I'm going to set this up as follows. So here's my input voltage here. So I'm going to do a 10k resistor in series, well, let's see, let's, let's trim these guys down. Here's a little tip for putting resistors in a breadboard. I probably learned this from Kenneth. Um, if you, instead of trying to stick your resistors into your breadboard as they come like this, if you fold them over and then snip one of the leads off, now you have this little tiny package that fits into a much smaller space on your breadboard. So we'll stick that in. We can zoom back in. There's nothing happening out there. We'll take our other resistor, we'll snip that in half. So now we have two 10K resistors in series or 20K. So that's going to be the point that I'm going to sample my voltage from. So I'm gonna take my A0 pin here and connect it to that point in between those two. And now I need another 10K resistance to my ground point, which is back over here by my voltage regulator. Plug that in be a little bit hard to see, I think, on the breadboard here. So, but I think, I think conceptually with the diagrams, it'll start to make a little bit of sense. So let's see, I probably should have wired this so that those two points were a little closer together. There we go. Move our A0 wire here and we will connect our 10K resistance back to ground. So uh, just while I'm wiring here, I, you know, so in the math of the uh, resistor divider, the voltage divider. Um, I said that for, you know to get a three to one 
um, ratio between input and output voltage, I needed a two to one ratio between my resistances R1 and R2. How do we get from a two to one ratio to 20K and 10K? And it, it turns out, you know, just based on this equation here, which is our governing equation, any pair of resistances that is in that two to one ratio will give us our three to one input to output voltage ratio. Um, it could be 10K and 20K, it could be uh, 1K and 2K, it could be one ohm and two ohms. Um, the major difference will be um, uh, how much total current is going to flow from our voltage source down through this pair of resistors to ground. You can imagine if this is a 1 ohm resistor and a 2 ohm resistor, I have 3 ohms between my input voltage and ground, and if it's, you know, 15 volts as we're going on, we're talking many, many amps flowing through these resistors essentially doing nothing for us. Which is not a particularly good use of power in most situations. So often you're going to be using resistances in the thousands or tens of thousands of ohms range. You might not want to use as sort of like the infinitely high option. Like these could be, you know, a million ohms and two million ohms and the math still works out. But it only works out if we're really not putting any load on this output point. Um, once we start to do things with it, draw a little current or a little voltage out of it to read it or measure it or drive a circuit with it, um, we will start to cause that voltage to sag a little bit as we put load on it. And these sort of, the higher these resistances are, the less load we're able to sort of put on this output point before we start to sort of change its value. Um, so for a, you know, a given set of circumstances, a given amount of load, you could calculate what your ideal resistors here are. As a rule of thumb with Arduino, something in the tens or, or tens of thousands of ohms or thousands of ohms is a decent choice. Let's put it that way. Um, but if you're wondering how we got from one to the other, um, uh, that's, that's how, that's a, a rule of thumb and why we sort of chose those values. So coming back to our resistor ladder here. So I, again, I have my, I have 20 K resistance kind of between power and this point here. I'm sampling this point here. It's kind of do pin a zero on my Arduino. And then I have a 10 K resistor to ground. So let us hook that up to our Arduino IDE. And again, I think I said this a few weeks ago, but um, the only real difference between these Pro Minis and the Unos that we're working with is that they take this additional circuit board, um, this serial adapter. Um, on your Arduino Uno, you have a chip on board. On your Arduino, yeah. You have a chip on board that does the communication between the USB side of things and the serial side of your board to sort of upload code for you. Um, on these Pro Minis, because they're so small, they've taken that chip off the board entirely and put it on this external circuit board, which means you only need one of these circuit boards for every one of these little things that you program. Makes them cheaper and smaller, but of course you need this extra hardware to program them. So let's do a quick program. Um, I have not written this in advance because it's a very easy program to read, and I'll show you what it is. Um, we're going to say uh, int, uh, let's see, input pin is pin A0. In our setup function, this should all look pretty familiar. I'm going to do pin mode, uh, input pin input. Uh, in my loop, I'm going to uh, serial.println uh, analog read input pin. And I'm going to wait a second between inputs. And I want to make sure up here, I'm going to do serial.begin. Let's do 115.200. Um, and I will save this as a voltage test because it's going to make me save it before I upload it to the board. So this code should all look fairly familiar if you've been following along the past few weeks. I'm going to make my input pin an input. I'm going to do an analog read on it and print that value out to the serial port and then wait a second between readings just so we're not overwhelming ourselves with readings. So let's uh, double check that we are on the correct COM port, pro or pro mini. Just make sure that uploads. Come back to the table and hopefully it does. See my little flashy lights here. It's a very good sign. Oops, I did not load. Mm, why would that be? Make sure I've got the right. It's usually because I haven't selected the right board. This is a 18 mega 328 pro or pro mini com three. Is it because of this? Let's see. Let's try that again. Oh, it's throwing me errors now because I'm trying, it's, it's still trying to upload the first time. Huh. It's not wanting to upload. Have I got this plugged in the right way? That would be a good question. Ground. Ground. Black and green. I 
think I have. <laughs> more, uh, more failing on camera this week. I was, you know, things were going so smoothly. I didn't want anyone to think that I really knew what I was doing. Just in case it is the Arduino itself, thankfully. Like I say, I have a whole pile of these things hiding in a box. Ooh, a little tummy cam for you. And I'm pretty sure I know <laughs> at least the ones that are of the newer generation are not going to be dead, which would be a really good sign. So let's unplug those. And we'll just lay this one in here. A, zero. We'll just make sure we get all the pins right. Uh, why is oh I see and I gotta move my power pins as well. I'll get this programmed first. Here we go. Let's turn things around. Plug this into pin A0, which is here. And we'll plug in our programmer again. Let's see, let's make sure that showed up on my computer. COM3, Pro Pro Mini. There we go. Get a little blue, blue flashing lights in the programmer is always a good sign. And we'll just open our serial monitor here and we'll double check. So right now that analog pin isn't connected to anything. So it's going to be giving us sort of spurious and random readings, but at least it's giving us back readings once a second, which is what we asked it to do. So that's a very good sign. So now come back over to the table and I'll wire this up to read the value, the incoming battery voltage value. <laughs> Everything runs off the rails at 90 minutes. Yeah, this is probably like as good a reason as any to like try and keep things to 90 minutes um, because uh, things do seem to go right awry uh, as soon as as soon as we start to improvise here. So that's one, two, three, four. So that's my VCC pin there and my ground pin here. Just double check the labeling. One, two, three, four. Yes, that should be good. If I'm going to blow anything up, the time would be now. So... We'll hook up power to power and not to ground would be good. And grounds to ground. So I've got my power coming in here. My my uh, A0 line is connected to this point in the middle of my voltage divider. Ground is ground and VCC is power. So when I turn this on, hopefully nothing blows up. Oop. But I have no little indicator lights. Do these have indicator lights? I hope so. They do. Aha! So the first sign that something is wrong. What would be wrong? Ground, power, power. Let's stick this into raw. There we go. So now that's powered up. And this is powered up. And we'll open our serial monitor. And we should see that our values are relatively consistent, right? Because now we're sampling an actual voltage um, and not sort of the sampling the air, as it were. Um, but we can do a little better than this. Rather than giving us raw input values, let's have this do the scaling for us. So in my loop code here, I'm going to break my analog read out of my print statement here and make it an integer. So I'm going to say int reading take an analog read and shove it into this variable called reading here. Um, and then I'm going to do some math on it. I'm going to say uh, reading equals reading divided by three. So, oh, here, let's see. Uh, how is how is this math going to work? So my input reading is going to be between zero and 1,024. Um, and that should represent the voltages uh, zero to five uh, on our input pin, or really on our battery, that'll be 0 to 15. So I'm going to use this map function again, which I remember from a few weeks ago, which I, I love so very much. It takes this input value here, says, hey, this input value in this range that I give it between, in our case, 0 and 1024, map that value between 0 and 15. And in fact, I'm going to say map this between 0 and 1500, so I'm not losing precision. Um, and let me um, let me make this a float. Um, if I do this as an integer, it's going to always round it off to whole numbers. If I do it as a floating point number, it'll leave some decimal points on it, which is really what I want. Um, because down here, I'm going to map this to the range 0 to 1500, and then divide it by 100 after the fact. So I should get about two decimal points of, of precision on my reading here. Let's upload that. All right, so nothing really to see over here. That'll flash. That should upload. 
when we upload, we'll open our serial monitor here, what I should get, what I should get, what I should get is, oh, <laughs> I didn't add the code back where it, uh, it actually prints anything. I was just printing new lines here. That's not particularly useful. I'm gonna print my reading, and actually I'll, tell, I'll have it print my reading, and I'll do serial.println uh, volts after, put a V after it, just so I remind myself that now I'm taking readings in this voltage range. And we'll see how we do. So currently, ah, so currently it thinks I'm seeing about nine volts um, on my power supply input. If I turn this down, yeah, you can see my power supply voltage dropping as I adjust my my input voltage here back and forth between zero, between seven volts, nine volts, 10 volts, and so on. So this would be a really simple way of doing a, a, a battery monitor, um, uh, battery monitoring circuit. So now if I you know plug this into my car, was our sort of our example point was like, we're going to um, use the Arduino to measure battery voltage. Um, I could, uh, you know, use use this circuit as voltage divided. Take that that 15 volts of possible input range, step it down to five volts, measure it in the Arduino, and then step that back up to 15 volts. Oh, thank you, Kenneth. I was wondering why I didn't have um, why I didn't have any any decimal precision there. Kenneth points out so um, since I was dividing by 100, it was treating this whole thing as an integer division by dividing by 100.0. Um, it's saying, hey, I know I want some decimal precision here. Keep this as this floating point type variable. Um, that's going to give me some decimals without rounding things off. There we go. Yeah, there we go. So now it's seeing you know, 11.2, 11.4, 11.6. Um, not the most accurate measurement, I will say, based on what I'm actually looking at on my power supply. Or maybe my power supply is not all that accurate. Um, but... Uh, it, you know, close enough. And it's also with, you know, three random resistors that I pulled out of a box. If I wanted this to be better, I could use higher precision resistors and could specifically match them to make sure they were in that two to one voltage ratio. Um, I could also do some calibration on my analog input pot or in input port on the Arduino. That would sort of clean things up a little bit. Um, but as a proof of concept, that's how you take a higher voltage measurement and step it down, step it down using a voltage divider to a lower voltage. So it's in that zero to five volt range that the Arduino can measure, if that sort of makes sense. Questions? Comments? I pulled a um, an old battery out of a laptop just to, to see what it was. Um, if we're talking about battery types, this is an old lithium ion battery from Dell. It's 11.1 volts. So it's a, it's a three cell lithium ion battery at 3.7 volts per cell. And I'm not going to rip this open um, because I still need this battery. But um, it's interesting. You can see this has this long cylindrical shape in here. Um, that's because a lot of these batteries are just... Uh, 18650 cells, this classic cell, lined up in series and parallel. In fact, this is probably, you can see, I would guess this is one, two, three sets of 18650s bodged together inside of this power pack to make this up. This is a very, very common um, form factor. I think at least the OG Teslas used 18650s stacked together in the hundreds in series and in parallel to make up their battery packs. I'm pretty sure that is true. Kenneth, I'm not ripping it open. I still need, I don't have everything off that laptop yet, so I'm not going to rip it open at least tonight, I don't think. Mm. But um, yeah, I just, I literally pulled every every battery I could out of storage and now I'm, I'm just glancing over at them. So if there's anything more I wanted to talk about before we sort of prologue next week's sort of idea for the circuit that we can build and sort of code together. Um, I'm realizing there's a couple of, a couple of interesting batteries that we didn't look at earlier that I want to highlight before we, we move along. Um, this is a, a little LiPo cell, um, I think from SparkFun I ordered this. Um, this is a, you can see it's a 3.7 volt, 500 milliamp hour cell that has this little mini JST connector on it. So the, the JST is sort of kind of the that kind of connector. JST means a lot of different things. There's a lot of different series of JST connector, but a lot of the ones for miniature batteries like this are all sort of semi-standardized. Um, so when you get like a single cell charging board, in this case also from SparkFun, it will also have a compatible charging port on it. This is meant to charge a single cell LiPo off of USB, which is pretty cool. Um, 
Yeah, definitely spark fun. Um, may, actually, maybe this was Adafruit and this was spark fun. These have just been floating around my bin for a while. Um, but so this is a lithium polymer battery. And part of the thing that's cool about lithium polymer, since you have that gel electrolyte, is you can you can take your two electrodes as very thin films and put your electrolyte as a gel or polymer in between them and then fold them all together into a very flat, thin package like this, kind of like an ice cream sandwich. If you want to see this process in action, cool plug for a friend, um, you should check out the YouTube channel Strange Parts if you haven't already. Um, Scotty over there recently visited a, a lithium polymer battery factory in China. You can see the machine actually winding these layers of electrolyte and material together to make a battery like this. It's actually, it's super cool. They like, they do all kinds of like tracking and testing of every individual battery. There's a QR code on each one that like lets you track where each battery is in the factory. Um, it's really very cool. So anyway, go check out Strange Parts and see that video. You can see how these things are made and how they get them those so small that's why this is sort of the form factor of choice for like cell phone batteries because obviously an 18650 is not going to fit inside most cell phones these days um, but a flat pack battery like this and you can also you know this one um, has you know about 500 milliamp hours because of its size you could sort of make this any length and width and depth that you wanted to sort of fill out as much space as you want inside of your flat end user device um, and then um, pillow packs yeah it's it kind of says that they're called um you can sort of make them whatever capacity you have the size for and they're they're really super cool um this one has a little bit of that protection circuitry on it um i went and did some googling this has over over discharge and overcharging protection on it in a little tiny circuit board that you can see under this non-conductive capped on tape that's on the outside there um, not all of these will come with that protection circuitry built in and either way you would use a you know a circuit board like this a charger to to charge it um, so anyway, that's a cool battery that was flo floating around that I have had in my collection for a while that I wanted a chance to show off this evening. I think that's about the end of it um, that I wanted to show off. Um, questions, comments, issues, concerns? Mini glowing orb, Chris? That's exciting. Um, that sounds like a fun... You had a lot of things on the docket over there, Chris. Did you, um, did you tell us about your that motor project? I'm scrolling back up the chat to see if you told us a high torque motor with an effect that needs to be wireless. 1600 watts. That's a not inconsiderable amount of power. I would think the, I mean, thankfully we exist in a world where high speed brushless motors and motor controllers and battery packs that are sized to fit them are a thing that would exist. So I would guess that you're working in like the RC car, RC plane, quadcopter ecosystem. What are you building that needs 1,600 watts of wireless fan power? That is fascinating. Uh, getting up to some mayhem over there, which I like quite a bit. Um, oh, one other piece of technology that I, I didn't really show off tonight, and this actually, this might be a good final demo to do um, before we move along. I think I've said final thing like three or four times, um, but, you know, it's <laughs> it's my stream. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, I just sort of wanted to take a second and sort of demonstrate um, some of this like voltage sag with current um, because I think it can be a, a tripping point for folks who are working with battery powered projects for the first time. You know, once you get like, okay, well, this is a 1.5 volt battery. So I'll put eight of them in series, that's 12 volts. And now I can power, you know, 60 feet of LED tape with this. Um, well, you're gonna run into current you know, current capacity issues long before you, you know, can actually power the whole thing. Um, but I really just wanted to show you like the, the, the dynamism of the effect of, cur of voltage sag when you start pulling current out of these things. And so to do that, I have this device, um, which is kind of a fun thing to have lying around. This is a, um, essentially a constant current load. Um, it's sort of the inverse of the constant current power supply that I've been using to power all these things. You can set it for how much current you want it to draw um, and it will apply enough load to this big FET actually under this heat sink um, to cause to draw that amount of current out of whatever device you hook into the inputs. Um, this one specifically is meant for battery testing in that not only can you configure the current but if I step over oops not zero amps, step over here, you can set a, oops, come back, cut off 
voltage. You can say, hey, I want to draw power out of this battery at a specific current until it reaches a specific voltage and then turn off. So for example, if I was like, well, this is, you know, this is a 3000 milliamp hour battery. Um, if I run this at one amp, how much capacity does it actually have? Um, I want you to turn off when this gets to 3.4 volts. Um, and this will automatically run and time until you get to that point. You can also use this to like test power supplies, um, you know, by just pulling current out of them, but it has this kind of cool feature where it will cut itself off at a particular voltage. So I'm gonna start by, um, let's set this to not one amp, let's start a little lower than that. Let's start this at 100 milliamps. And when I attach this here, I'm gonna hit the on button. Let's see if it'll let me turn it on. Yeah, it's under voltage, so it won't let me turn it on. In fact, I'm gonna have to adjust that voltage limit first, it occurs to me. Uh, let's see, voltage, step over here. So 3.5 volts is obviously higher than what I'm going to be able to provide. I'm gonna say cut off is 0.8 volts. All right, so step over, please pull 100 milliamps. Clip that to one end. I wish I had a double A battery holder of the right size. I probably do, but it would involve tummy cam, and well, you've had enough of that tonight. So I'm just gonna hold this battery in place here. Turn the load on, and you can see that I'm pulling 100 milliamps, and already, actually, I'm, I'm pulling closer to 200 milliamps. For some reason, I have 100 milliamps offset on this device, and I'm not entirely sure why, but you can already see that my voltage has sagged down from that nominal 1.5 volts to 1.36 volts, right? So if I turn this off, we'll increase our current draw to 200 milliamps and turn it on. And actually here, I'll show you before I turn it back on, you can see with no load on it, I'm at 1.48, 1.49 volts, right? So no load, this really is a 1.5 volt battery. When I pull 200 milliamps of load out of it, I'm down to 1.3 volts, right? So if I was counting on having, you know, eight of these in series being 12 volts to drive some LED tape, even pulling just 200 milliamps, which is not a lot of current for LED tape, um, I'm already sagging down, you know, 1.3 volts per cell is going to be like just over 10 volts along the full length of the tape. Let's turn that off here. Let's go a little bit wild. Just because I can pull this much current out doesn't mean I can pull it at full voltage. So this is half an amp. And my battery is sagging now down to 1.15, 1.14 volts, and so on. And at some point, can I adjust this live? Yeah, it sure can. As I continue turning that current up, I'll hit a point where my battery voltage dips below that cutoff voltage that I told it that I didn't want to exceed, which I think was 0.8 volts. So I'm now I'm pulling a full amp out of this battery and it's down to 0.8, which is pretty impressive. But as I continue to go, it'll beep at me eventually and say, hey, nah, that's too depleted. I'm not gonna let you run anymore. It's gonna turn the circuit off and the battery will slowly restore up to that 1.5 volt cell. You can tell there is a little bit of a memory effect here. And Travis, this kind of goes back to your question about duty cycle. Um, with various chemistries, especially alkaline and lead acid, there is a little bit of like memory effect bounce back. So if I was gonna run this at, you know, if I had to run this at pulses of one amp and then turn it off, I might see that there was a minimum amount of time that I had to let the battery not have any current draw on it before it would bounce back up to its full voltage and current capability. Maybe, maybe not, depends on the chemistry, but that might be sort of the closest we get to duty cycle there. Um, so this is also, this is the device you would use to make some of those fun graphs of like, if I pull, you know, 100 milliamps, I get this capacity. If I get 500 milliamps, I get this capacity. Um, but mostly I just wanted to use it as a programmable load to show you that voltage sag, even on just a very basic battery there. I can do the same on this lithium battery here, the 18650, which has a lot more convenient points of connection. Um, I can turn my, I'm gonna turn my amperage down quite a bit here. Half. So this is reading, this is fully charged. I charged it earlier today. This is measuring about 3.99 volts, which is quite high. If I start pulling half an amp out of it, we'll see we sag down to about three and a half volts, right? So this is a 3.7 volt nominal cell, but we can see that it only stays about 3.7 when I draw less than 200 milliamps out of it. Right? As I increase that load, which it's happy to provide, right? we're, we're successfully providing that much current, but um, that voltage does start to sag more and more as I pull more and more current out of it. If I pull up to an amp out of it, now we're reading at about 3.2 volts. Right? So if I had three of these cells in series to be my 11-ish volt load to provide a power to a 12 volt device, if that 12 volt device is 
pulling an amp of power, it's actually like getting less than 10 volts on its power rail. So something to think about as you're putting together battery powered devices. You mean ab cam? Oh, <laughs> instead of tummy cam? <laughs> yeah, I need like a, I don't know. When I, when I take this to Twitch, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll have tummy cam. We'll have emotes. It'll be great. <laughs> uh, you know what we could, you know what? Let's do one more thing. I, I, sorry, I swear. Just one more thing. Well, it'll be interesting here. This is still on. Let's turn that off. Here's another... Here's another LiPo. Let's take a quick look at the voltage on it, because I did chart these all manually, more or less. Just make sure that we're all... Yeah, 3.95 volts or so. Let's put these two cells in parallel and see what happens to the voltage sag at various current ratings. So I'm just going to clip those two pins there and these two wires here. And if I get unpredictable results, I'm going to blame it on the fact that these are just literally clipped in here with alligator clips, which is you know, not the most stable. Oh yeah, that one's already slipped out. Maybe we'll twist those together. This is the kind of shenanigans that I get up to in here. It's like, oh, what if we, well, I should probably solder these and I should put some heat shrink on them and do, ah, just clip it together. That's fine. I'll clip it together. All right. Clip those. Oh, it's already come untwisted. I'm not a, not a professional twister. All right, so those are clipped together. They're showing about 3.93 volts, you know, put together like that. Now, if I, let's turn our current limit back down to 200 milliamps, right? If I turn that on now, we'll see we're sustaining 200 milliamps at 3.6 volts. Let's make sure those are both connected. Just give that a little wiggle, right? If I turn that current up at half an amp, right now I'm only pulling a quarter amp out of each of these, right? So we've got a slightly higher voltage level than we were able to sustain before with just a single cell. And as we continue to increase, we should see slightly higher voltages than before. Honestly, not that much higher. I would have expected a little bit higher than that. Um, but this can be one way to, if you're seeing voltage sag and you're in a battery powered situation, um, you can think about putting batteries in parallel with each other because then each one individually is supplying less current. Um, and so it will tend to um, the voltage will tend to sag less um, than if you're working with an individual battery. Oh, there we go. So this was actually, there we go. So this connection over here, this ground connection was just shitty. Um, so I wasn't actually connecting both batteries. So now I'm connecting with one amp um, and I'm only sagging to 3.5 volts instead of 3.2 volts. So I sort, of, I sort of reduced the effect of that voltage sag by paralleling these batteries. And this is one of those reasons why if you're using like one of those hobby batteries, like those, you know, 3S2P batteries earlier, if you found that your you know, having that maximum voltage output from your arrangement of batteries was critical. You could use batteries that put some of their cells in parallel so that they sag less and provide more power for a given voltage, if that sort of makes sense. Cool. So anyway, a little demo there that I hadn't planned on doing, and it kind of failed and it kind of worked. So just another typical <laughs> Sunday night here on YouTube, I think. Okay. Just one more thing. I know, I know, I know. Okay. That will be the last thing unless there's anything else, but uh, if there's not anything else, then that will be the last thing. Um, let's talk about, uh, next week and building some circuits. Um, so we talked last week, we, we, we had a great riff session last week. Thank you to everyone who was here. Um, that was, that was really cool. We, you know, we sort of riffed on like what, what we wanted to talk about next and what people were interested in and parts that they had in their toolbox, which turned out to be some really interesting things. Um, there were some vibration sensors, there were all kinds of stuff, you know, people who were interested in like you know, Arduino and electronics, um, or maybe branching out some. Um, so all those ideas are in the pocket and I would love to hear more if you, as you think of them, you're like, oh, I, wow, this was a cool thing that I stumbled across or I'm curious about. Like always, always open to more suggestions. Um, but one of the things that I, that I really took away is like, you know, I would, we would love to talk more about code and coding practices and we needed to sort of find a way to do it. And sort of the idea that we stumbled on was all building this, the sort of the same thing um, all together and then we can sort of code it all together or at least in a similar fashion. Um, 
And we talked a lot about what that could be, but one idea, and I think it was Michael Trudeau had this, this point, was like, it would be great if that circuit more or less used the parts that were in essentially a starter kit. Um, I, I think I had an idea about using like NeoPixels and button matrices, and, oh, which would be really cool, but like not everyone really wants to be rushing out and like buying another like, you know, 20 bucks or 25 bucks worth of parts right now, which I totally get. Um, so trying to stick to things that we might already have or we're like a small addition or a future investment in the thing rather than like, hey, everyone buy this additional stuff to go messing around with. So so here's what I, I'm going to propose um, as the starting place for our build it together, code it together Arduino project. This is just my first whack at this proposal. So this is not like a, here's what it is. This is a, I'm throwing this out to you. I'm gonna explain it all. And then I wanna hear what you think. Um, and honestly, like we, I want to hear what you think about it tonight and then we might try it next week. And if it doesn't turn out to be right, we'll punt from there as well. Like this is not, nothing is precious about this. This is just sort of the space that I came up with for us to play in as we're thinking about building something that we can all have together. So we can all sort of code similar things and learn from that. So this is the circuit that I, that I would like to, to use. Oops, that's the code. This is the circuit I'd love to use as our base. So this is an Arduino Pro Mini, we all know very well. Five LEDs, My, I have some multicolored ones, um, but you could use all the same color. Five current limiting resistors. I, my, mine are 330 ohms, but they could be 220, they could be 1K, sort of anywhere in that range. Two buttons and one potentiometer. Um, and this sort of felt like everyone probably has this kicking around from their starter kit or in their home. Maybe your kit only came with four LEDs, that's fine. Maybe you only have one button or you have one button and one switch. Part of the goal of this is gonna be like, you know, to write the code altogether in a way that like it is easy to make a change from five LEDs to four or to six, um, from a button to a switch and vice versa. Um, so hopefully this is something that everyone has at least a close approximation of. Um, Cause I think it will be, I think, I, you know, some of the other more exciting, like not more exciting, but more exotic things like, not everyone has an IR remote in their kit. Not everyone has a seven segment display wired up or wants to get one wired up or even has one. This seems like they, they sort of standard kit of parts. And so to go along with it, um, I have written just a little bit of code um, that you can use to test your device. I should say also the um, the circuit diagram for this setup um, is both in the slides and on the website, jeff.glass slash electronics bash as always. Um, and you can find it there. This is what the diagram looks like. Um, it's very simple. It's just five LEDs hooked up to five digital pins of your choice, right? Because part of our goals will be to, we, you know, if I hooked mine up to pins uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, um, but you could hook it up to some other pins if that made it easier for you. And you'll see in the code where to redefine those. Two buttons as input pull-ups connected to ground and this potentiometer hooked up to ground and five volts and one of the analog pins as we have before. Um, and so that code, there's two bits of code on the website. One, which is literally just for testing the LEDs. Cause I recommend if you're gonna build this in advance to play along with us either next week uh, when, we, when we play along with this together, I recommend you sort of do it in a couple of stages, put the LEDs in, run some test code. And I've written some for you here. Or I'd encourage you to write your own that just steps through all the LEDs. And why don't I just show you what that looks like? We can put that together. Make sure I've got the correct COM port selected. COM port selected. Ah, that's basically what that looks like. When you upload that code, all the LEDs will flash in sequence like that. Um, so like do this thing one at a time, put the LEDs in, run the LED test code, make sure the LEDs work. Um, and then um, when you've got that working, you can, you know, install your uh, buttons and your potentiometers and, oops, I was gonna upload to the wrong Arduino. That's all right, get out of there. Uh, let's see, why are you not responding? Upload this new bit of code. That will be an Arduino Uno. Upload. And when you upload your uh, the LEDs and inputs code, that will give you your LEDs flashing. The rate should be controlled by the potentiometer, right? So that'll tell you that your potentiometer is working and then the buttons will control 
the direction that the LEDs are moving in. Just a really, a really short bit of code to like, just make sure that all of the hardware is working. Cause some of the feedback I've gotten is like, the coding examples are useful, but I, I struggle to get the hardware always plugged in right. And until the hardware works, I can't tell if the code works. So two pre-written bits of code, I suggest doing it in two sections, get the LEDs working, then get the inputs working and we'll have it to play together. So this is the idea that I've had. Like this is a pretty basic set of hardware um, to play around with. Like you've got some, a couple of inputs, a couple of outputs, an analog input. What are we gonna build with this? And so here's my proposal and this is what I want some feedback on. Um, uh, I'm gonna propose that to this basic hardware, everyone can choose to add, uh, uh, to start with, one sensor of their own choosing. Um, the sensor that is mo in your kit or in your in your house, I guess, if you have things screwed around the living room, um, that is most interesting to you. I know people have vibration sensors and distance sensors and motion sensors and fire sensors and all kinds of interesting things. And so what I would propose is, you know, because everyone has some sort of different stuff and because those are kind of the most curious components, I think, um, pick a sensor and we'll write some code all together. You know, everyone's code for working with that sensor will of necessity have to be a little bit unique, but the code that binds all these projects together will be very similar. So here's how I would sort of propose that we, you know, started thinking about this. Um, we're gonna you know, build all of our basic code together. Um, we're gonna test the sensor, right? And that's gonna have to be kind of an individual process. Um, and then we're gonna use this sort of step-by-step -step to build a device together. Um, very simple as it might be like, well, okay, so we've got you know, a, an input coming in from a sensor. Um, we have this sort of output hardware working. Maybe we have each of the five colors of LED correspond to a, a given level for that sensor. Um, let's say if it's a distant sensor, maybe uh, the lowest red is too close, the highest red is too far, and green is some middle value. And we'll play with setting thresholds for various outputs and various states in that sensor. Um, or a water level sensor, we could do the same thing, sort of measure how deep into a set of water it could get. Um, a heat sensor, a light sensor, all these kind of things. Each of these is gonna kind of give us um, a different application, but the code will be all sort of very similar from the sense that's gonna behave similarly on the output end. So that would sort of be our most basic example is like we'll do a sort of a threshold setting. Um, each of those LEDs will light up when a thing is sort of high or low or perfect right in the middle. And that's that's why I chose that like red, green, yellow LED schema to be like, oh, maybe that middle one is like the perfect sweet spot. Um, once we've sort of done that sort of most basic example, we'll build on it, right? So maybe next we add an averaging mode, right? So not just taking a look at the sensor as it is now, but taking an average over a certain amount of time. Um, for a distance sensor, maybe that averaging is every half of a second. For a temperature sensor, maybe that averaging is once every 30 seconds, right? Um, as we're looking at sort of broad trends over time, we can build some code that like looks at how we incorporate that math into things. How do we do a rolling average of things, which can be a useful thing to do whether you're working on very tight time scales or very long time scales. Then maybe we add in and like an over or under alarm mode, right? So this could be, um, you know, if you are looking at a light sensor, maybe you want the sort of a sweet spot of light in your office, living room, whatever. That'll be your middle sensor. When it falls high or low, the various LEDs will light up. When it gets very high or very low, it will do something else. Maybe it blinks that LED. Maybe it uh, sounds a buzzer. Uh, maybe it flashes all the LEDs. We could sort of define what it means, like jump from uh, from one mode to another mode of our code. Um, so now we're working in not only like things happening in real time, but jumping back and forth between a couple of states of behavior of our code is sort of the goal of that. Um, and then maybe some other things like, um, and this can, this is going to have to be kind of piecemeal. Um, maybe adding additional uh, display elements. Maybe you have a seven segment display kicking around or a bar graph or an LCD screen you wanna use um, that we could hook into the same code. Um, buzzer strobes for this alarm mode would be kind of fun, like maybe flashing LEDs. Um, we will probably start uh, by hard coding all these trigger levels and alarm values, but it'd be cool to be able to program that over the serial port or to program it on the device, maybe with a combination of button presses. Um, so those would be like stretch goals, I guess. Um, and doing it off of battery power, like we talked about tonight, would be another another cool thing to do. So um, this is just kind of like how do we how do we build a common set of circuitry to be able to talk about building code together, and then allow people to apply it to the hardware that they have in their home. So just like thinking about like ways you could apply this common hardware to things, like maybe this like 
over under level is a light sensor to keep the work the work light level on your workbench consistent. Um, maybe it's a long-term temperature humidity sensor, right? If you have one of those that tells you, you know, is it in my comfort zone range? Is it higher than usual? Is it lower than usual? Um, you could build a sneaky game with a, a motion sensor. Um, if, uh, if you move too fast or too slow, or maybe with a distance sensor, right? Can you keep yourself moving at a consistent rate most of the time? Um, I know there were some vibration and sound sensors out there, right? Can we um, create something that like keeps sound at a, a reasonable level? I don't know what you do with a flame sensor, um, but I suspect we could find something fun. Maybe put it on the oven, <laughs> do something fun. I don't know. The fire sensor is kind of a wild card. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's also like, if, if the sensoring idea is not, not necessarily a good one, um, just like another thought of what you could do with the same hardware is like, as we have this like s slew of lights, could we make a game where you you know have to tap the the tap one of the buttons every time the green LED lights up and like to make kind of a rhythm game or something like that and maybe it outputs to serial or something like that so anyway just just sort of spitballing at that point what what this might be but anyway that was my that was my take on the we all kind of build the same project how how does that does that seem I guess, first of all, does that seem plausible? And do, is that something that's interesting um, to people? I mean, the one option is like, I just go through this exercise um, and do it on stream and show people. Um, but I think it's more interesting if people are building their own things and trying this and like sort of chiming in with like, oh, I tried to do this and it didn't work or look at this cool thing I managed. Um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you think? Is this kind of an interesting idea? Is this kind of a silly idea? We can also like use this as a jumping off point to like talk about more you know, talk about coding topics regardless, and, and honestly, probably in a kind of more structured way than the last time I tried to talk about code on here. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm curious where people are, are at with this kind of stuff. Because um, I, I think, I think that talking about code and the math and the various structures, like we've touched on a lot of sort of individual ideas of um, typical like coding structures, but not in a really structured way. And I think progressing through kind of a simple project like this would be, um, would, uh, would be a useful thing to, to do it. Oh, let's see. Oh, my, my chat just way updated. I it, like, I had like 20 messages just show up here. Um, let's see. Oh, Mary's here. Mary's been here for a while. Hi, Mary. Wow. You've been here for a while. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, we start something on fire and monitor the fire. That would be a great rhythm game with fire would be a great time. I don't know what happened with the chat there. That was wild. <laughs> oh man. Mary, do you want to build along with us? Do you want to build a circuit? Actually, I already have one. I can give you this one and you can build it again if you want to. <laughs> be a lot of fun. Mm. Well, in any case, Sound off if you have thoughts, because um, I think this might be the kind of thing that we do next week, um, is like step through, let's see. Palmer says, don't have a lot of physical space at home to set up things. Yeah, that is fair. Um, there is sort of like a, a a space limitation. I sort of, my sort of goal would be like, this is about as much space as I, th I think we could hopefully need, is like uh, Arduino, uh, Arduino next to breadboard should be hopefully as much as we as we need to take up. And also like hopefully a thing that we could sort of take apart and put that together later. Um, Cause it's not terribly complicated, but that's fair. Like, and that's totally like, I, should, I think I said last week, like I, it doesn't matter to me at all if people are like at their workbench in solder fumes, making things going wild during this, or if you're not wearing pants and eating peanut butter out of the jar on the couch right now, like that is totally fine. Um, uh, like I have no expectation of what anyone does or doesn't do along with this thing. It's just kind of a fun thing that we get together and do on Sunday nights and whatever that means to you is, is totally, totally good. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So I, I think stepping, stepping through this in a structured way will be a fun thing to do. If you want to like play along at home or try and develop something like this, the circuit diagram and the code to test it out is on the website. If not totally good, I think this will still give us like a good, I think, <laughs> I think honestly, I will be able to do a more, St structured coding explanation and talk about um, math and variables and um, think like common programming strategies and patterns like the sort of delta time like the you know did I have I checked on the baby recently pattern that we've kind of stumbled across the 
like setting a boolean setting a flag and then adjusting it later and checking it later like we've we've sort of used a few things but i think i can do honestly a cleaner job myself of talking about them in a way that will be useful and having this as kind of a a common base of explanation i think will be a useful thing to us um so yeah so think think about putting this putting something like this together in the coming week um, and seeing what you think about yourself. Cause, cause I'll have one to play with next week. And if we get to like reference it together and I'll honestly, I'll probably pull out a couple of different weird sensors. I had my, my ultrasonic distance sensor kicking around on the table here earlier as a place to start. Um, maybe it'll do, I have, I think I have a fire sensor in my, my kit of parts. Um, in fact, tummy cam or ab cam. Thank you, Mary. Um, let's see what's in the kit of parts that we could play with. We've got laser sense digital temperature sensor temperature and humidity shock sensor another temperature sensor flame sensor there we go that'll be fun joystick we got integrating a joystick would be kind of a fun thing line avoidance sensor so there's some good possibilities there um yeah so i think that'll be a fun discussion for next week is like to talk more talking about, to be really candid like i want another crack at talking about code and having done it once kind of like rambly i could do a more structured lesson on code structures and this i think will be a good a good place to do it and having laid out kind of in advance like this is like a, a basic process for like okay i wanted to do this and then i'm going to add this feature and then add this feature which is really how i think about building um building up code to begin with like get the very basic thing working all right now add this now add this now add, and make it slightly bigger and bigger and bigger each time um, i think that will be a good thing for us to practice um all together yeah i think um i think that's pretty much what i've got for this week um yeah I didn't set anything on fire. I'm kind of delighted. I also didn't write as much code this week. Like you'll notice the code examples on the website are just the, the test code for this, this basic setup here, which I, I feel fine about because um, we're going to write a lot of code next week. Um, and then the week after that, we'll, we'll see where we go. Um, we got so, so many good suggestions last week. Um, it might be a week where we talk more about like circuit fundamentals. Um, I think it'd be kind of fun. So like the, the honestly, like, I know a thing I've gotten a lot of feedback on was like that fundamentals of what is an Arduino thing that I did first off, which, which I think for a lot of the people who are still here was like very rudimentary. Like I think a lot of the people who have, who have been hanging out with us on the regular on Sunday nights had, had seen an Arduino before, before this series started, I think it's fair to say. Um, but a lot of people who viewed that first one did not know what an Arduino was and have been like, this was like a helpful context. And they left after the first like hour, like, oh, I know what, what an Arduino is. I don't really care about digital, right? So I'm going to leave now, which is totally cool. It might be kind of fun to do a, a, to do like, take a little break from Arduino and do a similar thing um, with something like a Raspberry Pi, um, which I will be honest is not something I, I have used and I, I have a couple, you know, a handful of them kicking around in, you know, iShot here, but I have not done a ton with. Um, and so that might be actually be a kind of a cool excuse for me to reduce some refreshers, like, I know how to get started with a Raspberry Pi. And then since it's kind of like electronics focused, these weekends have been, it'd be fun to be like, how do you get a basic bit of code running on a Raspberry Pi that say blinks an LED or reads a digital pin or something like that? Kind of like the same basic things that we did with an Arduino, we could do on a Raspberry Pi as well. Um, the sort of more advanced functionality is, I will say, a little bit beyond me at this point. But, you know, I have already learned so much just from doing these Sunday nights. Um, maybe this is a good chance to, like, to learn. Um, write a little Python, I think, will be our, my, would be my language of choice that would write this in. Um, and then that might be an interesting segue to, like, get into, like, how do you do communication between a computer um, running a bit of code and uh, an Arduino? Because um, since the Raspberry Pi really is just a, a tiny computer, um, how do you send data back and forth to do interesting things with the two of them together? I don't know. That, I don't know if that'll exactly pan out, but that may be kind of a fun, a fun thing to do. Because next week will be Arduino lesson number ten, and it might be good to take just a little bit of a, a little bit of a breather, um, and do either Raspberry Pi. We could do circuits. We could do oscillators uh, the other like the one piece of arduino that I, I we haven't touched that i think is sort of necessary is um built taking a take kind of 
I'm not even going to read the Gannett's comment. I can't immortalize it in my voice. Um, is the process of like, now you've built this project with an Arduino Uno. Um, it's working really well. I want to immortalize it forever. I want to turn this into a semi-permanent project. How do I take this project that just has wires stuffed into these like holes here where they're going to fall out at any point and turn it into a more permanent setup? How do you take, you know, this, this chip that's doing all the work and take it off of this board and put it onto a place where I can solder it in place for all time. Um, and removing the, the Arduino chip from the Arduino and putting it into a separate circuit, and how do you get that set up, and how do you program it, I think is a really valuable skill um, that we should at least do soon or come back to. Um, so that was one of the things I was playing with this week as a fun thing to do, because it's, it's honestly, it's been a couple years since I've had to do that. Um, but I think that would be a, a fun and valuable topic for us to talk about at some point. Because a couple different ways to do it. It's not terribly hard, but it's super, super valuable in terms of making these things. So you don't end up with an Uno with wires dangling out of it inside a box, which is just not going to hold together forever. But now I'm just rambling and uh, I see we're almost at 90 minutes. So, um, uh... <laughs> Chris says, Use just, just the Atmega in my own setup off the Uno will be interesting to dive into. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you can, in, in many situations, you can pop this chip off, and there's a relatively straightforward ways to put it on a breadboard and get it working as the Arduino again without too many external components. Um, that would be that would be valuable. We could we could maybe do that in two weeks. I don't know. I'm just I'm sort of musing about what the future is now, but we'll get through next week where we talk about um, some more fundamentals of code and be prepared next week. I'm going to ask you about like what, um, what you want to do the week after or, or, or maybe I'll just do something. Who knows? We'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Uh, well, as we are finally, you know, as we're nearing 90 minutes, we're just over 90 minutes and we're getting a little bit loopy. I'm going to draw things to a close here. Thank you very much again for spending Sunday night with me. Um, if you have questions, comments, issues, or concerns, um, fast way to reach me is uh, on Twitter at Jeffers Glass. All of the slides uh, and the code for tonight are on the website, jeff.glass slash electronics bash. If you haven't subscribed yet, not to be a YouTuber, if you don't mind subscribing, um, self selfishly, if I get, I'm at like 91 or 92 people now, if I hit 100, then I get to be youtube.com slash Jeff Jeff Glass Glass instead of slash C49264, whatever. Um, which would be really convenient for any number of reasons. Um, so like, I don't, I don't really care about the numbers, but that would be like a really small quality of life improvement. So smash that bell and subscribe <laughs> uh, <laughs> or don't, I don't care. Um, cause I, I, I will know I will see many of you back here next Sunday night at 7 PM central right here, uh, on YouTube. Uh, we'll talk more about code. Um, where we stand a very, we haven't lit anything on fire yet, have we? So maybe doing a pyro sensor and lighting things on fire is for, for episode number 10 is maybe like the, the culmination that we really all deserve after a really good nine weeks of not lighting anything on fire. That might be good. Mary, do, Mary doesn't get a vote. Mary, my wife, uh, does not get a vote in this. We'll, um, we'll just don't, uh, we'll, it's, you know, or we can, everyone can vote on fire. I know there's at least one fire vote in the household. There's one no fire vote. So we'll just, you know, we'll figure it out from there. <laughs> In any case, have a wonderful week, y'all. Stay safe out there. I'm thinking about all of you. Thank you for coming together on these Sunday nights and just um, having a good time and uh, and building some things with me. Uh, it's always real fun. It's fun to succeed. It's fun to fail. It's fun to lay things on fire. And I'll see you next week. Bye.